Welcome to the world of tomorrow! Science fiction is not a genre about the future despite the appearance and setting. It has always fundamentally been a means of addressing issues and topics that apply in the present, using the framing device of taking place in a distant tomorrow as a means to present arguments for why we should reconsider behavior today. A new New York City is culturally more similar to the modern day city than any sort of speculation. And of course, Futurama is no exception to this. Coming off the tail of his success on The Simpsons, Matt Groening wanted to produce a series that allowed him to do the things that series never could without any of the expected baggage associated, no matter how closely that baggage wanted to stay attached. Many were anticipating, if not outright clamoring for, The Simpsons, but in space, and the first several episodes were a delivery on this topic. But that's not to say that the show would stay this way. Because while Futurama was constrained heavily by the weight of expectation, it would later grow into so much more than the basic concept under which the idea was sold, both to audiences and the network. Because the entire point of jumping into the future was to depart from the present, and yet, this desire only arose out of a sense of being held back by it. Futurama, despite all the effort not to be so, wound up as The Simpsons but in space, and yet it grew out of this label by focusing much more heavily on the latter part of that declaration. A strong dive into the characters themselves, a way over-educated writing staff, and a respect for the audience bordering on the unrealistic managed to make Futurama one of the most iconic shows of the decade that had dominated airwaves. And this is all in spite of, rather than because, of its family tree. This retrospective will cover the first life that Futurama ever lived, covering roughly the first four seasons as they aired on its original home network of Fox. I will be covering individual episodes one by one, with each episode's retrospective being split into three parts, recap, review, and wrap up. Recap is a general detailing of the episode as a whole, and why this video has brief in the title. Review is about the episode in the context of the show at large. And wrap up is anything I couldn't find another place for. Lastly, Futurama is a show with many adult themes, including and involving the following topics. Violence, substance abuse, racism, sexism, talking dogs, and trauma. And while I make an attempt to sanitize my language for an easier viewing experience, I will not be straying away from these topics when they appear in the show. As such, viewer discretion is advised. Now, in order to go 1000 years into the future, we first have to go to the distant year of 1999. Space Pilot 3000 Philip J. Fry, a delivery boy from New York, 1999, delivers a pizza to a cryonics lab only to learn that it was a prank call. As the call took place near midnight on New Year's Eve, Fry decides to bring in the new millennium by opening a beer and drinking alone, only to fall into a chamber where he remains for the next thousand years. He awakens on New Year's Eve, 2999, but as he had very little to live for before, he's able to quickly adapt to the concept. But what he cannot adapt to are the rules of this futuristic society, namely, that people are assigned jobs based on their skill set, and labor is non-negotiable. So he runs from the fate assignment officer, Leela, escaping to the city where he meets Bender, a bending unit in line at a suicide booth. The chase continues as the two become cornered in a museum of talking heads, but Fry encourages Bender to disobey his programming, to bend the windows to safety, and they escape into the ruins of old New York. But the sight of his old life reminds Fry that he has nothing in the future, and he resigns to his new fate when Leela catches up to the duo, only for Leela to change her mind and tear out her own career chip, inspired by Fry's rebellion. The trio head to Professor Hubert J. Farnsworth, Fry's only surviving relative, and plan to leech off of him as they escape from the police. In the end, he offers to give them jobs aboard his spaceship as a delivery crew, and Fry embraces his new life as a delivery boy. Episode 1 had the immediate responsibility of justifying itself to the world at large. Coming off of the meteoric success of The Simpsons, it was curious why one would move away from a franchise that seemingly has no trouble merchandising and crossing over with little regard for anything else, in order to create something new from the ground up. And the way that Futurama addresses this concern is by tying it into the narrative of the pilot. Fry is told that in the future, everybody has a job assigned to them, largely against their will, with no option to do otherwise. This is an accepted idea in the year 2999, but Fry's arrival shakes things up enough about free spiritedness and nonconformity that he's able to convince both Binder and Leela to forego their predecided life trajectories in favor of something else. And while it's not a sure thing what that something else might be, it is, at the very least, a decision made on their own, so there has to be some value to that. 
And ironically, this spirit of rebellion is what has defined Matt Groening's earlier hits just as well. The Simpsons began as an icon of counterculture, going against the commonly accepted grain of contemporary television, and yet, it caused a trend in television to imitate this rebelliousness until the sardonic satire of that show became the norm. And Groening was the creator at the center of all of this, with the pressure that anything else he created should follow in that same success. But Futurama rejected the superficiality of this messaging, preferring instead to embody the spirit of his works. It would remain a matter of time to see if the success would be imitated too. The series has landed. The new Planet Express crew is sent on its first official job, delivering a package to the moon. Fry is excited about this development as he's always dreamed of being on the moon, but the rest of the crew seems annoyed at the simplicity of the job. Once the crew arrives, it's revealed that the moon contains a large amusement park, which Fry is eager to attend. But the park is shallow and artificial, with none of the mystique that Fry was anticipating, so he convinces Leela to allow him to take a ride off the tracks so he can explore the moon properly. This results in the duo being stranded and forced to work overnight at a moon farmer's ranch, with nights being two weeks long. Meanwhile, Pinder and Amy are trying to get the keys to the ship back after it was mixed in with the delivery, a crate full of claw machine prizes. But when Bender tries to use his retractable arms to retrieve the keys, he's thrown out of the park and onto the moon. He comes across the same farmer as Fry and Leela, only to be chased off for sleeping with the farmer's robot daughters, and they flee on a rover, only to be caught by nightfall and its freezing temperatures. But Fry is able to find shelter in the original Lunar Lander, where he and Leela prepare to wait out the night. While there, Leela is finally able to see the Earth from the moon and understand the mystique that Fry had been searching for all along. In the end, the farmer returns and the crew is saved by Amy, whose newly acquired claw machine skills pick up the lander. Executives wanted Futurama to take fuller advantage of its setting and explore more of the world and setting rather than the characters, as the show's staff may have initially wanted to do. As a result, many early episodes are structured around the crew being sent to a new planet with the mission of delivering a package while learning about the culture there. This fits more easily into the episodic Star Trek parody that the writers were surely trying to emulate at times, but also came with the issue of establishing many new settings before getting to explore the city of New New York and the characters of Planet Express. But this episode strikes a balance between these two by having the delivery be to a planet that, rather than serving purely as a new place to explore, serves as a representation of something that Fry would be missing as a new member of the 31st century, that wonder of exploration. He laments that the future has taken the excitement out of itself, that everything in the era exists as a result of several mundane, normalized advances, and nobody has the same sense of awe that he does. But through his natural curiosity, he's able to show the citizens of 3000 a fresh perspective of the things that they take for granted. And it's this infectious innocence that spreads to Leela, giving her a new appreciation for the mundane that perhaps even people of the current year could learn to appreciate. I Roommate Fry's living habits are beginning to become a financial and hygiene issue in Planet Express, so he's kicked out to find a long-term place to live. Bender offers to let him live in his apartment, but being a robot apartment, it only has 2.0 cubic meters of space, not enough for Fry to do much more than stand upright. So the two of them look for a new place to live together, stumbling upon a spacious apartment that has everything they need. But when it's discovered that Bender's antenna interferes with the TV signal, he's told to go back to his old place without Fry. But Bender is too used to living with his friend and can't adjust to his old life, eventually not drinking to cope with the separation as Bender requires alcohol to function. Eventually, he decides to detach his antenna in order to properly live with Fry again, but after seeing the extreme length Bender was willing to go to for his sake, Fry agrees to move back in with Bender at his old apartment, only to then learn that Bender's closet is actually a spacious room with a great view. After seeing the first few scripts, Fox asked the showrunners to make a few more down-to-earth episodes to better flesh out characters, and as a result this episode was written, the intention to establish more about the setting and how the characters got to where they are and would need to be for the show's run going forward. And yet, despite, or because of, this episode being a very functional one, it wound up poorly received. Not that it's an entirely bad episode, in fact it probably has one of the best jokes of the show's entire run. But there was too much ask for it, for it to reasonably deliver anything more substantial. But that's possibly not what we needed. 
An early complaint about the characters was the fact that Binder was viewed as a bit too antisocial for audiences to properly root for. So in this episode, he becomes an emotional wreck after it's revealed that Fry was his first friend, and that he lost him. This episode hints at the future emotional depth that Futurama would be able to achieve in its later run, even if it is still a ways off. This episode also toned down some of the darker aspects of the fantasy future that we see, and does so in a way that humanizes the thoroughly unfamiliar. Love's Labors Lost in Space Leela is lamenting her inability to find a decent guy despite her co-workers' attempts to have her meet someone. As she's being upset, the Professor sends the crew to the planet Virgon 6 to rescue two of every animal species there before the planet collapses due to overmining dark matter. But the planet is currently being protected by Zap Brannigan of the Diplomatic Order of Planets, attempting to prevent anyone from interfering with the planet's demise. Leela asks him if he won't overlook their excursion, but he ignores the request and throws her in jail. Yet later, when he breaks down crying in front of the fellow captain, her judgment lapses and Leela sleeps with Brannigan. He celebrates this conquest, but Leela is disgusted, and leaves to evacuate the planet regardless. While down there, she finds an unlisted creature which she names Nibbler, leaving him in with the rest of the cargo, where he devours the rest. Just then, the planet begins caving in on itself, and with no dark matter to fuel the ship as Bender was too lazy, they're forced to parlay with Zap to ask for rescue. But Zap is too difficult to work with, and Leela abandons the idea, only to discover that Nibbler excretes dark matter, and they're able to fly to safety. Zap Brannigan was originally intended to be played by Phil Hartman, whose work alongside many of the other showrunners on The Simpsons had proven his acting chops on top of an impressive audition that basically served as a formality, as Zap was written with Phil's voice in mind. But the untimely death of Phil caused his voice to be played by Billy West instead, with the character Philip J. Fry being named in his honor. West was able to provide a sort of smarmy charisma to the character, having him come across as the hammy parts of various fictional ship captains of pop culture. In this episode, we see the predictably pathetic interior of the posturing man, his insecurities easy to see even when they're not on display. This episode introduces a series of character relationships to the dynamic of Futurama, including the Kirk-Spock relationship of, of Zap and Kiff, the hilariously one-sided romance between Zap and Leela, and the introduction of Nibbler, doubling as a show of Leela's affection for animals, something we see repeatedly throughout the series. But more importantly, this episode also introduces some of the more absurd aspects of Futurama's worldbuilding, such as dupe overmining Virgon 6 to destruction, and then forbidding further efforts to undo this damage by guarding the planet or the fact that the entire mission was a tax deduction scheme by Farnsworth, giving a glimpse into the normalized lack of morality that serves as the backbone of the show's world, meant as a stark contrast to the humanity of some of its characters during its best moments. Fear of a Bot Planet While at a Blurns Ball game, Binder expresses his anger at the fact that robots are routinely given the worst jobs and treated like second-class citizens in society. On this note, the crew is sent to Chopek 9, a planet inhabited by robot separatists who want to kill all humans. Since Fry and Leela would be killed on sight, Binder is lowered to do the actual delivery, which only makes him more resentful. As the two humans are discussing whether they should be nicer to Bender in the future, they learn that he's been captured, and so they disguise themselves as robots to infiltrate the planet and rescue him. But when a human hunt is called, it's learned that Bender has been put in charge of the anti-human group, and the rescue mission turns to one of convincing Bender to return home. Fry and Leela are captured and taken before the robot elders, who run the planet in secret, and they demand that Bender be the one to perform the execution. But he declines the task, professing that he really does respect his crewmates after all, and the Planet Express crew escape, with the package Bender was supposed to deliver being used as weight to stop the pursuing robots. Part of what makes Futurama a satisfactory science fiction series is the fact that it refuses to rest on its laurels when it comes to establishing lore. It isn't enough to simply say that robots are employed alongside humans, but the writers have to question the social implications of this fact instead of using it as set dressing. Bender is resentful that he's treated as a tool, regardless of the validity of that statement, and this resentment is enhanced by the fact that, ostensibly, he is. But from what we've seen of New New York, this isn't just an insecurity that Bender himself feels, but one that applies to practically everybody else, as their jobs are things assigned to them. 
It's for this reason that Fry and Leela perhaps feel the need to treat Bender a bit better. They too are cogged in the machine alongside him, and can relate to the trapped feeling that encompasses his psyche. And all of this is to say nothing about the species-based discrimination that goes on on Chopek 9. The robot elder is spreading lies and fear about what humans are like so thoroughly that even they themselves have forgotten what's true and what isn't. We see more of this in the movies that the robots watch, an inaccurate depiction of humans designed to radicalize them against what is considered foreign. It's easy to spread anti-human sentiment on a planet without humans, but having lived alongside them as Bender has, that misinformation starts to show its weakness and he's able to see a clearer picture of how much robots and humans have in common, as well as how simple cooperation can be. A Fishful of Dollars After having an advertisement beamed into his dream, Fry and the rest of Planet Express go shopping where Bender is caught stealing Mom's old-fashioned robot oil. Hoping to raise enough for bail, Fry checks his old bank account and learns that over the 1,000 years he's been frozen, he's become a billionaire through interest. So he begins to live his life exactly the way he wants to, specifically by recreating as much of his old life as possible, including the purchase of the last can of anchovies on Earth, as the species has long since gone extinct. But Mom, of Mom's old-fashioned robot oil, wants the anchovies, as the DNA in the fish contains the information on how to produce a cheap oil that could drive her conglomerate out of business. So she creates an elaborate scheme to trick Fry into believing he's back in the 20th century in order to steal his PIN number and access his bank account, robbing him to force him to sell the can to her. But when Fry comes to, he realizes that he's been neglecting his friends and that his new life is better than his old one so he announces that he's going to share the anchovies with Planet Express instead. Mom, realizing that he's not the clever businessman she thought, leaves him to eat the last remaining threat to her empire. Fry was originally intended to serve as a fish-out-of-water everyman, his purpose to the plot being to ask questions about the setting that wouldn't make sense for the rest of the cast to explain to each other. But as the show developed, fewer things needed to be explained as New New York rapidly began to resemble New York more and more. It makes sense that the story would try to wrap around to being about topics relatable to a 21st century audience. Otherwise, it would be asking hypothetical questions with answers that serve no real function to us, making the stories pointless. So just as fast as Fry acclimated to the 31st century, his role as a fish out of water diminished, and he became just another character among the cast. And that's ultimately what the purpose of this episode's conclusion is. Fry's declaration of love for his friends is also a statement of his allegiance to his new time and new life, officially moving on from what he had in order to accept the new setting. And while he still needs things explained to him moving forward as much as the audience does, this comes more as a result of his dim wit than his temporal displacement. My Three Sons After almost having his organ sold, Leela admonishes Fry for his carelessness, a warning he ignores as he's convinced he still fits into the 31st century as well as he did the 20th. But when the crew is asked to deliver a package to the Emperor of Trisol, a planet with three sons, Fry is sent there on his own where, in addition to some salty food Bender cooked, the heat begins to wear him down to the point that he drinks a bottle in the Emperor's room. This bottle contained the Emperor himself, as the people of Trisol are all water-based, and as the assassin of the previous leader, Fry is declared the new one. But Leela continues to be concerned for Fry's well-being, stating that he likely won't last longer than any of the previous emperors. But Fry refuses her help, causing Leela to go back to the ship angry. However, once Fry is crowned, the previous emperor reveals himself as not having been fully digested, and the citizens of Trisol attack Fry in order to cut the real emperor out of his stomach. The rest of the Planet Express crew try to figure out a way to get Fry to cry the Emperor out so his life can be spared, but they fail to do so until Leela is finally called in by Bender, and she simply beats up Fry until enough tears are shed. The early episodes of Futurama were beginning to show some of their formulaic tendencies by this point. Executives wanted each episode to explore a different location or setting, and the way that these settings were introduced often came about as a means secondary to storytelling. One character flaw would be introduced, the crew would argue, a planet is visited where that flaw is put on display, and then everybody comes together to fix the problem. Much of the potential of the show was being wasted with introductions to foreign cultures that had very little to be said about. It was hard to convince audiences to care about characters we would only see once, as well as planets that don't get revisited. And so episodes like this were typically written to be more funny than anything else. 
While the typical formula for a travel episode has been established, the writers can still get mileage out of subverting existing tropes, if only to stand out. While this episode would normally have a humbled Fry accepting Leela's help and the two making up their conflict, we instead have a cathartic beating of a character who had to be forced to learn a lesson. This, among other subversions such as Binder's scheme to make Fry believe that Leela had died, failing when she shows up fine, give the episode a sardonic joy in subverting not only existing tropes, but a formula that was only recently established. A big piece of garbage. Professor Farnsworth is humiliated by his longtime nemesis, Professor Warnstrom, at a science conference. Worried that he may be too old for the science game, he decides to invent a smelloscope to detect the scent of distant objects, only to learn that he had already invented one. But when Fry tests it out, he discovers an incredibly smelly object, which is later investigated to be a ball of garbage from the 21st century that was launched into space. The garbage ball is headed straight for New New York, so Farnsworth creates an explosive device to dismantle it, only to install the timer wrong and waste precious time. After that plan fails, he comes up with the idea to create a second ball to smash into the first, and so Fry leads the city of New New York in littering as much as possible to create the mass needed. The second garbage ball is loaded up and fired into the first, knocking it off course and into the sun. And so, despite Leela's worries that the second garbage ball might come back to Earth just as the first did, everyone celebrates a happy ending. The society of the 31st century is shown as a sort of idiocratic utopia, where humanity hasn't quite progressed mentally very far, but the quality of life is still far above the equally backwards 20th century. Episodes like this one present a possible explanation of why. As so many things are assured for the people living in the future, there's been very little need to advance in other ways. If society can become so streamlined, then there's no reason to put in the work to understand why things are the way they are anymore. Everything in the 31st century is automated to be recycled and completely self-sufficient, and so the people don't understand many of the social issues purely because they're not exposed to them enough to have the need to do so. And so Fry is able to teach them the ways of the past, despite not being altogether that intelligent of a character, using what could be counted as street smarts to guide the way backwards. Because it's only by understanding why society had to improve in the first place that you can continue to guide it in a positive direction. Hell is Other Robots After a Beastie Boys concert, Bender is taken to an after party where he's given the chance to jack on by overclocking electricity. He quickly gets hooked and begins seeking out more and more hits, eventually redirecting the Planet Express ship into an ion storm for a fix. This causes his friends to show enough concern that he eventually seeks out repentance from the Church of Robotology. Now a convert, he starts to annoy his friends with his salvation, to the point that Fry and Leela begin to want the old Bender back. So they take him to Atlantic City, in order to expose him to the sleazy arts, and soon, he relapses to his old self. But one of the conditions of Robotology's conversion is to go to Robot Hell for sinning, and Bender is dragged away in the night by the Robot Devil, who sings songs about the ironic punishments he has in store. But Fry and Leela, feeling guilty for his damnation, track him down with Nibbler's nose, and they soon rendezvous within the depths of Robot Hell, New Jersey. The Devil acknowledges that if they can best him in a fiddle contest, Bender can go free, so Leela accepts the challenge and beats the Robot Devil with the solid gold fiddle before the trio make their escape. Early in the run of Futurama, there was a sense that Bender's antisocial antics wouldn't be appropriate for television, and there was pushback from the network to tone these elements down. And so it's easy to imagine that this episode would be made in response to these criticisms. The Bender that we know and love is a Bender who ignores these elements. This episode shows him having a complete flip to his personality, and as such, becomes much more annoying and much less friendly to advertisers, purely for the reason that nobody would watch those ads if they were sandwiched between religious fundamentalism. And yet despite this episode taking heavy elements of religion, it doesn't do so in a disdainful way. It would have been simple to punch down at robotology and have the preacher come across as hypocritical or self-serving. But as organized religion is used as a counterpoint to Bender's ideology, it still comes across as being the more morally justified thing between the two. Hell is Other Robots doesn't denigrate any group but its own characters, and the satire comes across as much more good-natured as a result, possibly helping to sell the message of Bender's personality being a good thing by not souring the pot with too much counterculture at once. A Flight to Remember 
As a present for his employees, Farnsworth invites Planet Express on board the maiden voyage of the Titanic, piloted by one Zap Brannigan. Hoping to avoid his advances, Leela pretends to be engaged to Fry, although Fry begins to develop actual feelings for her as they fake more and more of a relationship. But Amy's parents are also aboard the ship, and as they push her more and more towards hooking up with random guys aboard, she also fakes a relationship with Fry. Bender also meets and falls for a socialite bot, Countess de la Roca, who believes Bender is also rich like her. Amy and Leela feud over who gets to fake date Fry until Zap's incompetence leads the ship into a black hole, where the whole structure starts to tear apart. Despite her learning that Bender was a broke criminal all along, the Countess still pronounces her love as the two escape together. Amy eventually meets Kiff, who was promoted to captain as Zap didn't want to go down with the ship, and Hermes saves him all by getting over his trauma from a limbo accident two decades ago. Despite everything else that's changed, Romance in the Year 3000 seems to be a similar story as always. It makes sense. Love stories have remained a fixture of fiction for much longer than a thousand years ago, so they would be presented in the same fashion as ever in 3000. The long-term relationship between Kif and Amy begins in this episode, starting out as a ploy by her parents to finally get grandkids regardless of context, but blossoming into one of the more wholesome unions moving forward. Fry and Leela too get teased during this episode, the relationship that later on begins to define many of the human elements of Futurama, although for the next few seasons, it largely exists as a sort of will-they-won't-they -they sitcom fodder typical of earlier television writing. And of course, Bender also finds short-lived romance during this plot, something that shows off his lighter side and potential for real romantic connection. Given the content and context of the previous episode, Hell is Other Robots, we get an impressive array of range from the character. This episode was originally the first episode of the second broadcast season, but later relabelings put it as another part of season 1. Given this context, I'm abstaining from season wrap-ups during this video, as there's very little that functionally changes about the makeup of the show's crew between seasons, justifying exploring major differences moving from one to the next. Mars University The professor has Planet Express deliver a package to his office at Mars University, where he's a, well, professor. While there, Fry learns that by 31st century standards, his status as a college dropout is worthless, so he decides to attend Mars University and drop out in order to get more respect. But when he arrives at his dorm, he learns that his roommate is a monkey named Gunther, wearing an intelligence-boosting hat designed by the professor. Gunther and Fry feud for a while, with Fry resenting his roommate's intelligence and this culminates in Fry releasing Gunter's birth parents at a social event, embarrassing the monkey. Distraught by this development, Gunter removes the hat and runs away to live in the jungles of Mars, causing the crew to seek him out. Meanwhile, Bender is trying to teach his old fraternity how to party, and one of his schemes results in Leela, Fry, and the professor being thrown into the river. But Gunter rediscovers his old hat and puts it on, giving him the intelligence to save the crew. While debating whether to keep the hat or continue living as a monkey, he falls and the hat is damaged, now working at half capacity, giving him intelligence, but not enough to feel pressure to do anything with it. The writer's room of Futurama is one of the most over-educated writer's rooms in television, with over 50 cumulative years at Harvard and three PhDs between them. So for a college-centric episode to come out that concludes with a moral on the overall worthlessness of formal education, sends a stronger message than your friend who dropped out to sell quaaludes. Although to say that the episode is purely anti-intelligence is also a bit of an oversell of a single idea. While Gunter doesn't enjoy his intellect, that had much less to do with his actual brains and more to do with the pressure that he felt to use them. Building on the idea of the automation of the future leading to a decrease in intelligence, this episode divides society in an intellectual barrier. The smart become smarter so they can maintain the world, while the dumb get dumber as they live through all the automation. As things become more and more idiot-proof, there becomes a larger demand for idiots, a sort of ecological niche within society that's expanding. But far from this being a bad thing, it merely leads to more room for specialization within society. The professor is dim-witted in almost everything except invention, where he has savant-like tendencies. And of course, the job structure of putting people into the role they're best fit to perform reinforces this idea of over-specialization. When Aliens Attack Earth is invaded by the aliens of Omicron Persei 8, who destroy monuments and make demands to see McNeil, who it's assumed is the president of Earth. 
All ships and their crews are drafted to defend the planet from the invaders, but the counterattack is led by Zap Brannigan, and is therefore useless. It isn't until returning home that the Earth learns which McNeil the invaders wanted, a single female lawyer from the show, Single Female Lawyer, which aired 1,000 years ago as Fry had watched and accidentally shut off during the finale. So instead of fighting, Fry gets the idea to write his own episode and to broadcast it directly to the Omicronians, hoping that the conclusion to the show will please them enough to spare the Earth. But as Fry didn't finish the script, Leela is forced to improvise an ending where the single female lawyer gets married, which upsets the view base enough to threaten destruction once more. But Fry, having lived in front of the TV for most of his life, knows what 20th century television audiences want and wraps up the show with a more boring solution pleasing the aliens, and keeping the Earth safe for just a while longer. Building upon the more dystopian themes of Futurama, this episode sees a forceful military draft to lead an attack against an unbeatable enemy being announced with practically no pushback from the people being drafted. Where this sort of big government intervention is viewed as a sort of necessary evil to combat existential threats to survival. Combined with elements like a supervillain being elected mayor and stealing national monuments, this episode gives an impression of a future where rule of law is protected by a sort of political apathy, caused by the level of indifference many people have to authority, as it rarely becomes their issue to deal with. But on lighter terms, we have a very Futurama-esque approach to saving the world. Whereas the trope we've been trained on typically has us expecting some kind of showdown with the clever use of an earlier moral, Futurama has the world saved through the power of television, specifically through the power of mindless TV sitcoms and an ability to cater to the demands of those with enough brain rot to enjoy them. Fry and the Slurm Factory Fry and Bender see a commercial for a contest where the winner gets a trip to the Slurm Factory, which produces Fry's favorite drink, the highly addictive Slurm. Despite getting their hands on an F-ray, which allows the duo to see through anything, they fail to get the golden bottle cap necessary until Fry gets it by fluke. Once they arrive on site, the tour begins, although the host is repeatedly warning them not to inquire too heavily into the identity of their secret ingredient. But when Fry falls into the liquid on the boat tour, and Leela jumps in after him, as well as Minder since everyone else was doing it, the trio finds themselves behind the scenes, where they discover the real factory, as well as the fact that the secret ingredient is really a mucus secreted by a giant slug. The slugs of the Slurm factory try to chase them down, but when the Slurm mascot, Slurms McKenzie, meets with them, he declares that he's all partied out and sacrifices himself to allow them to escape. In the end, Farnsworth is about to warn authorities of the disgusting secret, but Fry convinces them that the professor is senile, so he can continue to drink his favorite beverage. Slurm in this episode is shown to be a highly addictive substance that even goes out of his way to advertise itself as such, and yet despite the clear effects it can have on the brains of those who consume it, it still stays on the market with enough people drinking it to increase its market share, advertising all over cities and television. It's not the only company we see that controls society in a similar way. A fishful of dollars introduces us to Mom, who likewise uses her wealth to control all of the robot market to rule society in a way that the average person is too ignorant and too powerless to stop. Futurama uses some of the dated elements of old pop culture to point out absurdities in how our cultural values have changed over time. Decades ago, the revelation that Soylent Green was made out of people was a shocking twist, but here, it's simply another fact of life. Hermes discusses the idea of replacing the Planet Express crew with Grunkalunkas, who effectively serve as slave labor, and it's simply a conversation between businessmen. And yet, at the end of the episode, when it seems as though the wickedness of Slurm is nearing its end, a loyal fan steps up to ensure that a billion dollar company prevails over the health of its consumer base. I second that emotion. Upset that Nibbler always gets more attention than him, Bender flushes the creature down the toilet, then laughs when Leela gets upset over this. Tired of how self-centered he is, Leela has the professor install an empathy chip into his head, setting it to Leela's emotional frequency so that he'll feel every emotion that she does. Leela's sadness over the loss of Nibbler encourages Bender to flush himself down the toilet in pursuit, and so Fry and Leela go to the sewers to help him. Once they reunite, they discover that the sewers are inhabited by a race of mutants who warn them of the tale of El Chuba Nibre, a voracious creature who eats everything in sight. They assume that this creature must be Nibbler, and Leela is used as bait to lure him out. 
but it turns out that Nibbler was not the creature, and Leela's fear over losing her pet again causes Bender to be unable to stand up to it. So he teaches Leela how to be a bit more self-centered, like Bender, and soon, Bender is able to fight back, saving everybody. In the end, the empathy chip is removed and everyone learns a lesson or something. Moving on from the earlier style and substance of Futurama, this episode leans more heavily into the structure that made the show so beloved in the first place. Not so much using the future as a means of exploring societal trends and predictions, but using the technology and trends as a means of putting characters into unique situations that can test them in ways that more contemporary workplace comedies never could. The idea of an empathy chip is something uniquely science fiction, but far from resting on the laurels of the genre and questioning the ethics of such a thing, these ambiguities are ignored in favor of character exploration. Leela and Bender are effectively opposites. Leela cares deeply about every living creature, Bender only cares about himself. Leela is strong-willed when it comes to doing something she views as right, Bender sides with whoever seems to be winning. And these two characters being at the center of Fry's friend group in the future shows how much of an everyman he can be, able to get along with such polar opposites despite everything that implies there shouldn't be common ground. And this common ground is explored in this episode. Having Bender act more like Leela is shown to be a miserable experience for him, while Leela benefits from learning to be a bit more like Bender, a thematic inversion of the way that their respective behaviors are typically viewed by the narrative. Branigan Begin Again Planet Express is asked to deliver the giant novelty scissors to the unveiling ceremony of Dupe's new headquarters in the Neutral Zone. Zap Brannigan, who has been given the honor of performing the unveiling, is mistrustful of the neutral people and arrests Leela for an imagined threat against the yarn people of Nylar 4. But as he's arresting her, he misses the ceremony and tries to cut the ribbon with the ship's laser, destroying the headquarters in the process. Zap is court-martialed and stripped of his title, leading him to wander the city aimlessly before winding up on the doorstep of Planet Express seeking a job. Farnsworth adds him to the crew, where he quickly gets along with Fry and Bender, who have grown annoyed with Leela's harsh streak lately. They plan a mutiny during their next mission, and Zap takes over, immediately putting the crew out for a suicide mission. Upon realizing that they're going to die due to Zap's incompetence, Fry and Bender put Leela back in charge, and she barely manages to get the ship back on course before it collides with the neutral homeworld. In the end, Zap tells a lie about his heroism in preventing his own mission, and Leela goes along with it as Zap getting his title back means he won't be able to work with Planet Express any longer. Dupe, or the Democratic Order of Planets, serves as a sort of intergalactic government for the setting of Futurama. It consists of several alien species, most of whom serve as the dominant, if not sole, inhabitants of their respective homeworlds. Even Earth is reflected in the same light, as there is an Earth president and everybody is united under a single banner. It's a slightly optimistic view of the future, one in which the nationalism that can unite countries and divide continents has been done away with in favor of more unity among planets. But despite this seemingly forward progress, also shows many of the issues that can arise out of an autocratic bureaucratic government with little to no opposition. For example, Zap is able to be put in charge of the whole planet's military despite his incompetence, and then, because he is the sole voice at the top of the planet's military structure, is able to commend himself as often as he likes, making his role at the top even more solidified as nobody can become distinguished enough to raise an objection. Many of those in charge in the year 3000 are viewed as supremely incompetent, only having their positions out of things like seniority or some sort of power vacuum. And so Zap Brannigan serves as a prime example of what can happen when too much power is spread over too little competence. Ahead in the polls. Leela tries to get Fry and Bender interested in politics, as she believes the issues are too important to ignore. While watching a political debate, Bender learns that the price of titanium has increased, and being 40% titanium, decides to sell his body for a bunch of money. He harasses everybody as just a head for a time, before eventually leaving to the presidential head museum to hang out with the others. But there, he learns that being a head isn't so great, and he decides to buy his body back. But it's been sold to Richard Nixon, who uses his new body to run for president again through technicality. The trio tries to appeal to Nixon's sense of decency for the body back, but when this fails, they break into the Watergate Hotel instead. Nixon catches them and makes a grand evil speech on how dumb the average voter is, which Bender records in its entirety as blackmail, trading the tape for his body back. In the end, Bender is whole again, and Nixon wins the election as he simply got a new killer robot body to appeal to the robot demographic. 
Robots in Futurama have always been shown as being treated like second-class citizens, a label applied due to their mass production and identity as being purpose-built machines, and also a label that these bots rather openly try to reinforce. Bender regularly calls attention not only to his mechanical nature, but his lack of empathy and other emotions that would make him come across as human. And this is something shown as less of a character trait and more of a trait of robots in general. The only defect about Bender is the fact that he goes out of his way to cause trouble rather than simply being adverse to stopping it. And so this complex relationship of viewing yourself as better than humans for your specializations, while being angry at lacking the same rights, even if many would remain unused, is what drives the robot populace to vote overwhelmingly for a candidate who simply resembles them. Robot Nixon takes a strong stance on killing all humans, the first such candidate that appeals to the needs and wants of robots. If equal treatment is implausible, then vengeance will serve as the next best thing. Xmas Story The Planet Express crew is on a ski trip, enjoying winter festivities, when Fry brings up the idea of Christmas Spirit, which his co-workers point out has been renamed to Xmas. Among this change are several other strange new traditions, with the old style of Christmas cheer being all but gone. Fry laments how lonely he is on Xmas Eve, but does so in front of Leela, who's never had a family to celebrate with. She runs off and Fry feels guilty, declaring that he'll get her the best present imaginable, despite the warnings from everybody else not to stay out past sundown, as Mom's friendly robot company created a killer Santa bot when they calibrated his standards too high. When Leela learns that Fry is risking his life to get her a gift, she goes after him and the two wind up stranded, cornered by Santa. But Bender, who is going out to mooch holiday spirit from people, is able to distract long enough for them to get away, luring Santa to Planet Express. He begins to terrorize the crew until they use teamwork or something to trap him in the chimney, blasting him into the skyline before sitting down for an Xmas dinner. Christmas specials have always been a strange sort of trend in media, the one time where shows go out of their way to produce an episode so tangential to canon that it only gets away with standing out so much due to the other formalities of the holiday. Futurama takes full advantage of this trope by having their Christmas, or Xmas episode be as strange as possible. The weirdness then builds upon the normal absurdity of the setting to create an episode so esoteric that it can stand on its own as a punchline, then builds further on this by explicitly playing off whatever audience expectations still remain. Fry and Leela argue at the beginning of the episode over who is more miserable on Xmas Eve, then, when this argument is resolved and the two make up, Santa doesn't care. What would normally be the thematic conclusion of a Christmas special is an incidental aspect of an Xmas one, but more than that, it also builds up Fry and Leela's future relationship together, the two both existing as strangers in New New York due to different circumstances. It leads to a pairing based off of mutual loneliness, a heartache that they can cure because they're both familiar with it. And so the final inversion of expectation this episode has is actually playing some of its themes completely straight. Why must I be a crustacean in love? Hoping to get Fry and Bender back in shape, Leela and Amy take the rest of the crew to the gym, only to instead notice Dr. Zoidberg's strange behavior. It's learned that he's undergoing a mating frenzy typical of his species, and so it's decided to take a trip to Decapod 10, where he can participate in the mating season with the rest of the crustaceans. But Zoidberg fails to find a suitable mate, and takes lessons from Fry on how to speak to women. But these work too well when the target of Zoidberg's affections, Edna, learns that all the kind words were really imagined up by Fry. She tries to seduce him, which Zoidberg learns about, and so he challenges his friend to claw plock, a fight to the death. Fry is able to overcome the odds, but ultimately gives a speech on why fighting over a woman's affection is bad, which Zoidberg uses as an opportunity to chop off Fry's arm. The fight continues until it's noticed that the rest of the Decapodians have all returned to the beach to mate, leaving Zoidberg behind. In the end, Zoidberg regrets missing his opportunity to reproduce and apologizes to Fry by reattaching his arm. Far from the first and far from the last episode to reference Star Trek, this episode borrows a majority of its plot beats from Amok Time, where Spock undergoes a similar Vulcan ritual that results in a fight to the death with his friend. But unlike that episode where a faked death resolves the issue, this episode takes the higher and lower route of having Fry first admonish the idea of a fight to the death before re-engaging with the activity, and then having this speech validated when the actual fighting gets in the way of the actual mating frenzy, Zoidberg's rage preventing him from ever finding love. 
Fry's relationship with Edna in this episode plays into the idea that differing mating rituals and habits can come across as more sincere after traditions have separated themselves far enough from others. Reproduction on Decapod 10 is done as a purely functional relationship, with performances of mating being much more animalistic out of a desire to preserve the species. The concept of finding a more emotional connection to another is something alien to characters like Zoidberg and Edna that it comes as a surprise that any two people would want to fall for each other, much in the same way that Fry's old-fashionedness is what inspired Leela to run from her old life back in episode 1, and much in the same way that Fry's 20th century ideals will continue to serve as a contrast to the modern-day future. The Lesser of Two Evils while at a museum for 20th century artifacts, Fry loses control of a car and happens to run into a robot who looks nearly identical to Bender, named Flexo. But after getting to know Flexo more and more, Fry begins to suspect that the bot may be an evil version of Bender, made worse when Flexo is brought aboard the Planet Express ship as additional security for a valuable tiara to be delivered to the Miss Universe pageant. Fry falls asleep guarding the delivery only to discover it's missing when they land, and the crew tries to track down Flexo as he's the prime suspect. They chase him backstage, eventually resulting in a fight between Bender and Flexo, where it's learned that the atom was indeed stolen by Bender. As it turns out, Bender was the evil twin all along, and Flexo was merely trying to warn the host about the theft. In the end, Flexo is misidentified as the culprit, and everything returns to normal. Flexo being set up as an evil Bender in this episode plays into the revelation that Bender really was the evil one all along, although it's a plot beat that isn't set up especially well. Mostly, we see Fry jumping to conclusions about his nature, with a very little difference between Bender and Flexo's behavior, Flexo even pulling a few harmful pranks on Fry to drive home this earlier paranoia in a way that hurts the later underlying message. The episode tries too hard to set up the Bender-Flexo ambiguity that the twist at the end loses some of its impact. But that's not to say that the episode didn't have its good moments either. The concept of a villainous version of Bender was a solid enough plotline that it would get later revisited in Bendless Love from next season, but the concept of a good Bender is an interesting one in the sense that we've seen the occasional glimpse into the more humane side of Bender's psyche, sometimes doing an action that confirms that he really does care about his friends after all. But then an episode like this can play into a decrease in the flexibility of his character, shoehorning him in as the bad guy version of another. It's a very subtle trend at first, but it spirals into more and more as the show progresses. Put your head on my shoulders. After Leela turns down Fry for a Valentine's date, he decides to go with Amy on a joyride in her new car, where the two wind up stranded. They do it to pass the time, which begins to turn into a regular fling between the two, much to the annoyance of the rest of Planet Express, and eventually even Fry. On a second trip, he tries to bring Zoidberg along to third wheel, as he thinks Amy is getting too clingy. But Zoidberg crashes the car and Fry's body is mangled, requiring his head to be grafted onto Amy's body to keep him alive. Fry then breaks up with her, despite sharing a body, and so Amy rebounds by getting a new date, leaving Fry alone while still third wheeling. Meanwhile, Bender sets up a sham dating service, hoping to cash in on the lonely and desperate around Valentine's, but merely wrangles up a bunch of people at the bus stop as dream dates. This results in Leela being at the same restaurant as Amy and Fry, able to stop the date from going well, so Fry doesn't have to go all the way with Amy's date. In the end, Fry is reattached to his body, and Bender tries to take credit for the hookups. The will-they-won't-they of Fry and Leela's relationship is, at this point in the series, firmly rooted in the they-won't territory of how relationships can go. While Fry likes the idea of Leela, he's still hesitant to put much effort into pursuing her as a partner, while Leela doesn't view Fry as much more than a co-worker. Although, she doesn't hate him either. By here in the series, Fry views Leela as his backup plan, and Leela, although she hates to think in these terms, views Fry the same way. But for now, both characters are still very much exploring options to varying degrees of success. Fry, as he doesn't let himself get too beholden to anything, and Leela, as she's only recently gotten used to the idea of going against the grain of society, as well as being soured by Zap Brannigan. And maybe a rejection of this idea is why Fry doesn't get too close to Amy in this episode. Fry has a chance to start over in life and to avoid all the past mistakes he's made, and one of those was his lack of close attachment. Ironically, one of the only things that allowed him to move into the future with a healthy mentality starting out. In Amy, he sees a return to form, that one of his mistakes was never getting too attached to a lifestyle and spending too much time as a drifter. 
A commitment to her is a commitment to non-commitment. Raging Bender Hoping to avoid catching brain slugs from Hermes, the crew of Planet Express see a movie where Bender antagonizes another patron to the point of instigating a fight. Bender wins the fight in a fluke, only to learn that the bot he knocked out was a famous Ultimate Robot Fighting League champion, and he's recruited on the spot. Leela offers to train him, as she once had ambitions of being a fighter that were shot down by a sexist teacher, Master Fnog. On the day of the fight, Bender wins, despite being outmatched, and he later learns that the fights are all rigged, with the most popular fighter winning every time. He revels in his new popularity as Bender the Offender, able to appeal to the lowest common denominator, and blows off further training sessions with Leela. That is, until the League decides that his popularity is waning, and he's re-debuted as the Gender Bender, told to throw the next match against Destructor. Leela refuses to train him for real at first, but upon learning that Bender's new foe is the student of her former teacher, Master Fnog, she agrees to teach him to fight. But on the day of the fight, Bender gets beaten badly anyway, until Leela learns that Destructor is being controlled under the ring by Fnog, and she fights him personally. In the end, Bender loses the fight, but all ends well as Leela was able to beat up someone who was mean to her in high school. Bender's abrasive personality is what causes audiences to love him in the first place, despite knowing full well that someone like him would be terrible to be around for real. So long as there's a layer of separation covered by the fourth wall, we can enjoy his antics without being affected by them. But it's still an important distinction that audiences eventually see a character like Bender get a sort of karmic justice, otherwise that fourth wall starts to degrade and people in the real world mimic his behavior, minus any of his charisma. This is an episode where that lesson gets displayed internally, with Bender enjoying the consequences of his personality before ultimately the repercussions show themselves. The haughty attitude of Bender is compared to the attitude of Master Fnog, a sort of undeserved self-righteousness spurred on by success coming before it was earned. It's easy to appeal to the lowest common denominator and then act like you independently earned that success, but if it comes to you from writing trends, then it'll disappear just as quickly as that trend is replaced. As for another random trivia from this episode, it was originally planned that Hermes would have a brain slug on his head for the rest of the season, but the writers realized that this idea was stupid and cut it out, giving us some Hermes scenes later on that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. A Bicyclops Built for Two while browsing the internet, Leela meets another Cyclops, the first of her species she's ever seen outside of herself. But before she gets the chance to speak with him, Fry shoots the guy and they're called away for a delivery. But Leela receives a follow-up message from him later, with the coordinates to his home planet, their home planet, and she heads there immediately. She meets Alcazar, a Cyclops who is the last surviving member of his race other than Leela. She spends the night hoping to repopulate the race, but the following morning he starts to show his true character as a sleazeball, demanding that Leela be born domestic and clean up after him. Fry tries to convince Leela that he's no good, but she already knows this, only sticking with the guy because she believes that the future of her race depends on it. He proposes, which prompts Fry and Bender to go searching for the forbidden parts of the planet, where they learn that he has four other identical castles to the one where Leela has been living. They crash the wedding alongside four other stiffed brides, who demand answers, and it's soon learned that Alcazar is a shapeshifter merely pretending to be the last surviving member of various races to marry unsuspecting woman. Leela abandons him at the altar, lamenting that she may never truly know her origins. Leela's history and backstory are inherent tragedies, never knowing her parents or even her species, and living without any close connections for most of her life. As she was raised without anybody close to her, she continues to live by pushing people away, never letting anybody get to know her well enough to date or remain romantically interested in, despite her tries. Because no matter how much she wants to date, she just can't bring herself to make the uncomfortable first step of breaking out of her habit of solitude. And so when Alcazar comes around, she's immediately ready to take that step that she's never taken before, believing that so long as the reason for her isolation has been dismantled, the isolation itself will logically follow afterwards. But old habits die hard, and soon the only thing keeping her in that toxic relationship is some sort of loyalty to a species that she doesn't know. And while Leela is yet to learn the true history of her birth, she spent most of her time affected by an unknown legacy. And so her loyalty to Alcazar is merely misplaced devotion to something that she thinks she knows about herself. A 
a clone of my own. After celebrating his sesquicentennial birthday, Professor Farnsworth begins to lament his old age and dwindling time left on Earth. To remedy this, he unveils his successor to his lifetime of invention, a perfect clone of himself who he has named Cubert. But Cubert is surly and uninterested in being the next professor, going so far as to doubt the validity or even possibility of many of Farnsworth's inventions. Once again feeling like a failure, the professor announces that he's reached the age of mandatory retirement in the future, and that he'll be taken to the near Death Star by the Sunset Squad. But his old crew won't accept that he's being taken away, and they use his smelloscope to track him down, finding the secret location and traveling there with the intention of breaking in by using Hubert's DNA to fool the system. They find the professor and escape, although the ship's engines are damaged in the process and only the professor knows how to repair them. That is, until Cubert comes to a revelation that the ship doesn't move, but the universe moves around it, and he's able to fix the engines to guide the crew back home. In the end, Cubert announces that he plans on taking after the professor after all, due to his newfound sense of wonder at the marvels of science. Futurama, the show, derives its name from an exhibit at the 1939 World's Fair that was meant to be a glimpse into what society might look like in the year 1960. The exhibit was, fundamentally, just an ad for transportation infrastructure, but the general vibe of retrofuturism is existent throughout the future show that would take its name from the fair. The specific aspect played upon the most is just how far off the mark the past was when predicting what is now the present, grand ambitions of far-off technology that still served the ideals of their time, instead of any sort of invention rather than mere innovation. Like how computers were anticipated to be much larger and more expensive as time went on, rather than the direction that they really took. Because despite all the set dressing, Futurama is not a show that makes any real attempt to predict the future. Their attempts would be as far off the mark as the attempts of history. It instead tells the kind of stories that would be amplified by new technology and new breakthroughs that would affect the world of today. Futurama wasn't even able to accurately predict the 21st century, but that was never the point. And so this episode introduces a new character who gets to learn this exact lesson. It's not about the hard science, Futurama is a show about that sense of wonder brought by science. How Hermes Requisitioned His Groove Back after Bender trashes Hermes' office prior to an inspection, he's sent on a leave of absence, putting a new bureaucrat in his place named Morgan Proctor. Morgan is much harsher than Hermes was, immediately reprimanding the crew of Planet Express for minor infractions, all but Fry, who she begins to take an interest in as she's attracted to his sloppiness. But when Bender catches her in the middle of this affair, he threatens to start telling people, so Morgan removes his personality data and sends it to the central bureaucracy, where it will presumably be lost. The crew of Planet Express, tired of the new forces in charge, decide to get Bender's personality back, but it's trapped in a giant in pile, and sorting through it will take far too long. Meanwhile, Hermes is on a spa vacation recommended by Dr. Zoidberg, only to learn that the spa is actually a forced labor camp. But he begins to fix inefficiencies in the camp, reinvigorating him to be a bureaucrat once more. He reconvenes with the rest of the crew, just in time to help find Bender's personality, which he does to the tune of a song, and once everything is put back into order, he has Morgan demoted, taking her place back at Planet Express. Hermes often appears in small roles in episodes, largely as a background force to continually justify how it is that Planet Express can stay in business, despite incompetence in, well, everything. It's a common trope for an incompetent number one to have a hyper-competent number two, in order to explain why it is that that number one can continue to function. But as the cast of Futurama is largely made up of incompetent, it falls on Hermes to be the brains behind every single one of them. This episode also plays into the absurd scale of the future, that every institution in our world of today must either have been destroyed by time or bloated to the point of absurdity. The central bureaucracy is no exception, so full of rules and procedures that it starts to make Hermes look reasonable by comparison. It plays up the general rule of law in the year 3000, system upon systems that reinforce systems to reinforce systems, to the point that merely functioning regularly breaks so many legal guidelines that in the time it takes for all the paperwork to be resolved, you'll have gotten away with it scot-free. The Deep South Hermes receives a mandatory fishing license from the central bureaucracy instead of his requisitioned pet license for Nibbler, so the crew of Planet Express goes fishing. 
but when Binder catches a giant bass using the ship's tether, they're dragged down to the bottom of the ocean. Fry, Binder, and Zoidberg seek out food while the rest of the crew adapts the ship for underwater travel, when Fry meets a mermaid. But when nobody else believes him, he heads out on his own to find her again, only to stumble upon the lost city of Atlanta. It's explained that the city sank due to overdevelopment after they relocated to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to boost tourism. Eventually, the ship becomes seaworthy again and the crew prepares to leave, except for Fry, who has fallen in love with Umbriel, his mermaid beau. But once he learns of the aquatic mating incompatibility, he changes his mind and joins the rest of the crew again. It's interesting that in this episode, Leela tries to convince Fry not to stay at the bottom of the ocean by stating that he belongs back on the surface, as though he wasn't displaced through time and struggling to adapt and fit in there for the last several months as well. Not so much in the sense that Fry is quick to adapt to Atlanta because he doesn't belong anywhere else, but because Leela ultimately made a decent point. The initial purpose of Fry's character was to ask questions about the setting that every other character is already familiar with, but he's long since outgrown that role. Now, if Fry has to ask a question as a stand-in for the audience, he's doing so because he's slow, rather than because he's from the past. The character of Fry has developed so much in just 25 episodes that his entire function as a character has shifted. While a lesser show would have created a character bible of sorts and then stood by it unflinchingly, Futurama has the self-control to know when not to exercise that restraint and let the characters exist more naturally, with developments occurring based on what would make a good episode rather than anything else. Bender gets made. Leela gets blinded on Elzar's cooking show, so he invites the crew to his restaurant to make things right, only to leave them with the bill at the end. So Bender volunteers to work off the dead at the restaurant in order to be closer to his hero, only for his lack of class or style to attract the attention of Donbot of the Robot Mafia. Binder is recruited and quickly proves effective at organized crime, ingratiating himself to the point of being brought along on a heist of Zubin cigars. But once the heist begins, Binder learns that the ship they're robbing is the Planet Express, though with Leela blinded, he's able to disguise his voice to remain undetected through the entire assault. In the end, Binder is able to get away with everything, although he quits the robot mafia as the call was too close for comfort. Just as often as Binder gets some sort of karmic one up ins he's likely to get away with everything he does in an episode. And while this can occasionally be done in a way as to keep the audience on their toes about what to expect, it's just as likely to be a result of other characters' failings that he can take advantage of, even if unknowingly. Leela's refusal to accept help for her temporary blindness results in her being taken advantage of during the heist, being useless to stop the ship from being robbed, or even to notice who was doing it. So a plot like this exemplifies that it isn't purely Bender's behavior that causes misfortune during the show, but other characters who continuously give him the opportunity to misbehave. But one other thing this episode covers reverts back to the lighter side of Bender's personality. While he's a good fit for the world of organized crime, he ultimately rejects this life after it coincides with his old one, realizing that he can't have both and that a decision needs to be made about where his true loyalties lie. Does Binder love to steal more than he loves his friends? The answer winds up being the latter, but it's a close enough decision that he had to think on it. Mother's Day It's Mother's Day, the day where every robot produced by Mom showers her with gifts in a pre-programmed day of celebration. But Mom herself is scornful of this holiday due to the love of her life walking out on her on that day 70 years ago, that love being Professor Farnsworth. So she uses an antenna placed in all of her robots to overthrow humanity, causing chaos in the streets and taking over the world with her in charge. Her three sons, not wanting to see her unhappy, decide that she needs to get back together with her old love, and they approach Planet Express for the man. The crew senses this as an opportunity to end the robot rebellion as well, so they agree. But the plan to seduce her works too well and Farnsworth falls in love for real, which delays the end of the rebellion long enough for the rioting robots to approach their cabin. In the end, Bender manages to get Mom's bra back after learning that the new robot society won't have liquor, and the rebellion ends, although Mom refuses to get back together with Farnsworth when she learns that the entire thing was only started as a ploy to stop her takeover. In the future, everything is automated to the point that people have become lazy and sluggish in all that they do that's not directly related to their area of expertise, all except for a select few characters, such as Nixon's head and mom. 
basically, anybody who is outwardly evil and capable of posing a threat to humanity and society. Because becoming lazy due to the level of automation fundamentally requires a level of trust in society to take care of the things that you can't. If you don't trust the automated transport system, you're more likely to try to learn how it works, and so the distrustful and wicked characters tend to be the ones with the best general knowledge about the world of Futurama. But as evil as a character like Mom may be, she's still human, and subject to the same desires as anyone else. Her plan to take over the world had far less to do with any desire for power and control, and more to do with heartbreak and the associated grumpiness. Being evil isn't really a personality trait, just a single aspect of a character with the potential to be so much more, and this episode, however disgusting, shows that Mom is, at the end of the day, a woman. The Problem with Poplars Lost in space with no food, the Planet Express crew head to a nearby planet where Leela discovers pits full of a delicious, non-poisonous substance they call poplars. The crew takes a few shipments home and begins to sell them, exploding in popularity to the point that they become a worldwide sensation. But when Leela discovers that poplars grow into intelligent creatures, she tries to stop sales of them, although nobody listens and her pleas are lumped in with the obnoxious hippie types. But everybody's tone changes when the Omicronians come to Earth, revealing that poplars are really their young, and that the intelligent species they grow into is actually the species that nearly destroyed Earth last season. They demand vengeance, to eat a few billion human children in exchange for the harm inflicted to them, but Zap Brannigan convinces them instead to just eat Leela, as she was the one who found poplars in the first place. They try to swap Leela out for a similar looking chimp, but when the ruse is discovered, Leela is saved by the original poplar child she'd been raising, giving a rousing speech on why eating for vengeance is wrong. In the end, the Omicronians are content with just eating a hippie instead, and everyone goes back to just eating all the animals that are stupid. This episode takes a few early plot points as well as the name from the Star Trek episode, The Trouble with Triples, although the similarities end pretty quickly outside of that having no more in common with Star Trek than any other episode of Futurama, although that is still a fair amount. The obsession the world suddenly has over poplars propels them into popularity faster than anybody is able to consider the ecological consequences of eating them. The fact that nobody knew they could speak until weeks later indicates just how quickly people are able to throw away common sense in favor of a cheap, tasty meal. The obvious connection would likely be to the modern western obsession with fast food. Much more pronounced in the early aughts than today, obesity was becoming an epidemic in America, and this episode shows a similar explosion in the food's popularity before anybody considered whether this amount of fattening corn syrup was healthy to consume in such large quantities. In the end, convenience wins out over care, although this episode's plot differs from reality by making the concern over poplars into a moral conundrum rather than a health one. Possibly because the healthcare in the year 3000 is shown to be so advanced that even Zoidberg can figure it out. Anthology of Interest Number 1 An anthology episode using the framing device of the professor testing out his thing longer by pushing buttons on a what-if machine. The first segment asks, what if Bender was 500 feet tall? Fry is upset over his lack of friends in the future, only for a giant bender to fall from the sky, and the two to immediately become friends. But the frolicking destroys parts of New New York, so the military is dispatched to fight them. This fails, and the professor decides to grow Zoidberg to 500 feet to fight Bender. This results in more of the city being destroyed, as well as Bender himself. As he lays dying, he has a tearful goodbye where he laments that he only came to Earth to destroy all humans, wondering who the real 500 foot tall giant robot is. The next story asks, what if Leela was more impulsive, but just a little? Leela learns that she's been named the inheritor of Farnsworth's estate should he die, and realizing the potential for inheriting his vast wealth, she pushes him into a pit of man-eating anteaters. But when Hermes figures out that she killed the professor, she goes after him next, which then leads to Bender, then Amy, and so on. Finally, she and Fry are the only two employees remaining, but as Fry doesn't seem especially bothered by her killing spree, she sleeps with him instead for his silence. Finally, the last section is, what if Fry had never come to the future? Fry finishes his delivery in 1999, only to narrowly miss being frozen in the cryogenics lab before a rift in space-time opens up. Nobody believes him about the rift, until physicist Stephen Hawking overhears Fry mentioning it and reports to a team of nerds in charge of keeping the universe intact. 
They kidnap Fry and try to piece together the evidence of the incident, hoping to recreate the events that were supposed to occur. But once they realize Fry was supposed to be frozen, he smashes the chamber instead, leading to the group being trapped outside of the universe. In the end, the whole anthology was revealed to be a creation of the What If Machine, making a world where the professor had invented the Finglonger. War is the H word. Fry and Bender sign up for the military to get a discount, only to wind up involved in a war against ball people when war were declared. Leela, upon hearing that Zab's military has a no-woman policy, decides that she should join the military, as well to prove a point as also because her friends seem to die when she's not around. She disguises herself as Lee Lemon and quickly distinguishes herself among the men, giving Branigan weird and confusing feelings. After the Earth forces are overwhelmed in the initial fighting and Bender is wounded, Nixon's head gets the idea to rebuild him with a bomb inside his stomach, then send him to a peace talk. The bomb is set to go off when Bender says his number one most often said word, ass. So Fry and Leela go on a mission to rescue him before he blows up the whole planet, which backfires when Bender, rather than abstaining, uses the bomb to threaten the ball race into surrender. In the end, the balls leave, surrendering, Leela is revealed to Zap, and the bomb is reprogrammed to go off when Bender uses his least said word, antiquing, which he immediately does. The military of the future, like so many other institutions of government, is designed largely to perpetuate itself. Just as Mom's corporation builds robots that buy products from her, and the central bureaucracy creates paperwork for itself to file, the military has to come up with new battles to fight in order to remain relevant and justify its own expansion. Given this position, Zap Brannigan makes for a fitting military leader, which an institution like this needs much more than a competent one. The entire invasion is farcical, with Nixon's head even prepared to blow up the planet to make it uninhabitable in order to achieve victory, a condition which is considered more valuable than whatever that victory might actually achieve. But this episode still has much of that future on a charm. Leela joins the military, making audiences anticipate a girl power story of overcoming gender obstacles. But, as that's a tired trope, it's really only Zap's weird urges and advances that give her any real trouble. Bender learning that he's been betrayed by his government and used as a Trojan horse in an operation is something that he gets over with extremely quickly to immediately turn and start making demands of the enemy. And of course, these enemies were merely bystanders in the entire affair, ruining the comparison to something like Starship Troopers while still keeping the militarist satire alive and well. And, by the way, Bender's actual most used word is Bender. The Honking Bender inherits a castle from a deceased relative, but while spending the night there gets spooked enough to run outside, where he's struck by a rubber-wheeled car. Over the next few days, he starts waking up in weird places, fearing that he's been doing something horrible at night, at least more horrible than usual. He seeks a psychic for help and learns that he was struck by a were car, turning him into a were car himself, where he's warned that he may soon try to run over his best friend. That night, he tries to hit Leela, offending Fry as he thought he was Bender's friend. But Leela survives and the next morning the trio head out to track down and defeat the original were car in order to save Bender. They find him in an abandoned automotive lab, where Bender transforms again, this time going after Fry, who's grateful that his friend is finally trying to kill him. In the ensuing chase, the original were car lands in an incinerator and gets destroyed, with everything returning to normal. A combination of classic horror with futurist science fiction, this episode plays up the absurdity of the combination in every chance that it gets, with several lines from old horror movies parodied and portrayed in a much less serious context. The concept of a wear car infecting others as a relic of a time long since past plays into many of the same fears of the ancient and esoteric that many horror tropes lean into, while also putting an ironic twist due to these ancient horrors being modern day societal staples. It's actually a bit funny that New New York is able to fit a 20th century vehicle on its roads, showing just how much automobiles have shaped transit and city design to the point that cities still show signs of urban planning around everyone using one. And in typical Futurama fashion, it's also able to parody aspects of modern television writing by mixing genre even further. Fry has the insecurities associated with believing Bender isn't his best friend, coming up during a moment when lives are at risk. His priorities being in the wrong place during the chase sequence, just as so many character-driven plots often involve a character behaving irrationally when confronted with an interpersonal issue resulting from the more driven plot lines.
The Cryonic Woman Fry and Bender notice that Leela left the keys in the Planet Express ship and take it for a joyride, accidentally bringing the tethered building along with them and destroying the whole business. So the three of them are fired and forced to find new jobs. Thankfully, Leela kept their old career chips and replaces them, only to accidentally have swapped hers and Fry's. Fry and Bender are given a job at the cryogenics lab, which they enjoy for a time until Fry discovers that his old ex-girlfriend Michelle was frozen around the same time he was, and has recently been thawed. She explains that her life started to lose its meaning without Fry, and that she froze herself for a new start. And now, with the two of them back together, Michelle wants Fry to go 1,000 more years into the future with her, as the year 3000 is too strange. They climb into a cryopod together, and wake up in a desolate wasteland. But Michelle's bossiness causes Fry to decide that they should break up again. In the end, Fry wanders around until he's rediscovered by Planet Express, having only been frozen for two days, with the pod being transported to LA. In the end, Fry asks for his job back, only for the professor to remember why he was fired in the first place, and refuses him. Michelle is normal, where Fry is not. Her reactions to the situation of being frozen for a thousand years more closely resemble what a typical person might think of if they were to be displaced from a familiar time, and these reactions also help to give an amount of context to the way Fry himself behaves. Because while Fry didn't fit in during his time, Michelle did, giving them opposite motivations for trying to fit in into the future. It's fitting that this comparison would be drawn now, as Fry has long since gotten used to his new time period, no longer serving as the fish out of water that he once was envisioned to be. Considering that Michelle first appeared in episode 1, the timing of this plot point coming up is not a coincidence. She had to have been a character planned to serve this role to the story from the very beginning. Fry initially fit into the future as he had nothing going for him in the past. Even losing the connections to his family wasn't viewed as an especially great fault, even if this would later be retcon in a future revival. But upon learning that Michelle missed him during his absence, Fry starts to go back on all the adaptations he's made during the last two seasons. After all, he was only able to move on from his old life because his old one sucked. So to learn that his old life wasn't actually that bad means that his initial motivation was invalid. Making the past seem better makes the future seem worse in comparison. Amazon Woman in the Mood Zap and Kiff go on a double half-date with Leela and Amy, only for Zap to crash the restaurant into the planet Amazonia, inhabited entirely by women and controlled by a mysterious femme pewter. Fry and Bender try to rescue them, only to crash on the same planet. They're all captured and given a tour of the culture there, which the men make fun of at every chance. The women are released and the men are sentenced to death. By Snoo Snoo. But before Kiff can be taken away, he confesses his love to Amy, which inspires her to come to his rescue. She tries to save Kiff, but ends up being cornered only for Bender's love affair with the fembot behind the femputer to result in the entire death sentence being called off. In the end, Kiff and Amy become a permanent couple and no one else learns anything. In what could almost be considered a C-plot, Zoidberg gets a new shell after molding his old one, even though his new shell happens to be his old one. It's not uncommon for television to try to portray a battle of the sexes type conflict in their storylines. These plots often get derided from both sides as being characterized by character assassinations to facilitate a plot that's usually artificial, going contrary to some of the overall themes of the show. As if the writers want to say, hey by the way, you should respect women, while also making every female character in the show insufferable for 22 minutes, rather than keeping this female cast strong throughout. And Futurama comes across as a show well aware of this trope and willing to poke fun at it. Zap Brannigan is brought back for this episode as an example of everything embodying smarminess and sleaze in terms of ginger equality, with Fry and Bender going along without acting out of character. Kiff comes in to serve as a sort of surrogate for anybody who doesn't really need to be taught to respect others, dragged through the same non-consensual situation as the others as a sort of collateral damage. That people can be hurt by disrespectful attitudes even if they aren't the direct target of them. And in the end, the episode doesn't end with some mutual appreciation learned in a harsh lesson, but because Bender slept with a Wizard of Oz trope, and that was enough to make the whole situation chill out. Parasites Lost Leela is being harassed at a truck stop, and Fry embarrasses both himself and her while trying to defend her honor. Later on, he's injured in an explosion, and the wound mysteriously heals itself. So Farnsworth and Zoidberg investigate, only to learn that Fry has been infected with worms from an egg salad sandwich he ate out of the truck stop bathroom. 
the Planet Express crew use miniaturized versions of themselves to enter Fry's body, so that they can flush out the parasites while Leela stays behind as a distraction. But this distraction goes so well that the two fall in love, the parasites enhancing Fry's brain power and coordination. Leela stops the rest of the crew from expelling the parasites as she loves the new version of Fry too much to lose him. But later, when the two are dating, Fry becomes unsure whether Leela loves him or if she only loves the parasites inside of him. So he threatens to damage his own brain if they don't leave, and they agree, only for the original Fry to once again embarrass himself in front of Leela, ending their relationship. Despite Fry becoming a much better version of himself in this episode, the feelings he has internally never change in regards to his affection for Leela. But it's only after the changes occur that she bothers to give him any attention, which makes those feelings appear much more one-sided than they truly are. No matter what else can be said about him, Fry is an impulsive, yet genuine person, possibly his most defining traits. And so for Leela to fall in love with a version of him that isn't the true one means that she doesn't actually love him. So Fry is willing to throw away every part of him that's not genuine in order to make sure that the relationships he has with others are. Leela's defense of the parasitic Fry comes across as a rather selfish action, that she didn't love Fry until he showed some sort of enhanced value as a person. She was only willing to give him attention when he became muscular and intelligent, even if he repeatedly states that the love he felt was unchanged. And yet, while this could portray her negatively, her actions come across as tragic, given the context of the last two seasons. Leela has always been shown to be a lonely person, down to an existential level. So her manipulating Fry isn't the type of thing that a malicious person does out of desperation, but rather, the actions of a desperate person acting maliciously. A Tale of Two Santas Fry, Bender, and Leela are sent to the North Pole of Neptune to deliver children's letters to the maniacal Santabot. But while they're there, their desire for Christmas to return to a holiday that brings people together encourages them to try to destroy Santa. The attempt results in the robot being frozen in ice, so they decide to rebuild Xmas's image by turning Bender into the next Santa and delivering presents once again. After a night of being blasted by various Santa traps, Bender gets caught by the police, who prepare to destroy him with the giant magnet. Fry and Leela go back to Neptune to free the real Santa in order to clear Bender's name, but when the greenhouse gases produced by the reopened toy factory melt Santa's ice, they flee back to Earth unknowingly taking him along with them. Santa ends up freeing Bender, only to then ask him for help with his annual rampage, as he had spent too long frozen in ice to terrorize the citizens of Earth as usual. So Bender helps him out, while the cowering Planet Express crew takes some comfort in the fact that the fear of the two Santas has brought them closer than ever. A second Xmas special episode that follows up on the first, this time parodying the other side of the Christmas special trope sphere. Whereas before we saw a parody of characters learning the true meaning of holiday spirit, now we get the trope of a character helping to save Christmas. And this is approached from both sides of the topic. First, the Planet Express crew get the idea to try to rebuild the original spirit of the holidays by saving the world from the tyranny of Santa. Then, Santa returns and saves Xmas from itself by going back on his usual rampage, Bender being at the center of both of these resurrections. Xmas episodes have always been largely gag episodes, primarily focused on telling a humorous story over anything with more nuance to it. You can tell from the self-referential aspects of design, like the Neptunian Screaming Grainings character design ethos, while also being Santa's little helpers. It's a bit refreshing that, after so much pressure from networks to emulate The Simpsons, we're seeing episodes like this one that never could have happened in that show. The Luck of the Fryish After getting extremely unlucky at the horse races, Fry laments the loss of his seven-leafed clover from childhood, something that always gave him luck when he needed it, despite the jealousy of his older brother, Yancey. So he takes Leela and Bender to the ruins of old New York in order to find the clover at his old house. As he's searching, he continuously flashes back to his childhood, including highlights of Yancey being envious of his dreams, goals, and even his name. But when Fry learns that the clover is missing and finds a statue of Philip J. Fry in his old neighborhood, he starts to piece together a story. That his older brother stole his clover, name, and lived the life Fry wanted to before being frozen. So he sets out to do some grave robbing, taking back the clover from its resting place. But once he arrives at the site and starts to dig, Fry learns the truth. The Philip J. Fry, who achieved fame as the first man on Mars, was not his brother, but his nephew. Yancey found the clover and gave it to his son, who was named for his uncle. 
Fry's story is inherently a tragic one. Due to the generally comedic nature of the show and Fry's lack of a sad reaction to the loss of his old life, this aspect is never really explored in the narrative until now, only being briefly touched upon in the episode, The Cryonic Woman. The fact that he's lost everybody close to him is only really a tragedy if the people close to him really were, in fact, close. It's why up to this point, and even 90% of the way into the episode, it's assumed that no tragic point will be made. Futurama is a comedy first and foremost, and as long as Fry and Yancey are feuding, it will remain that way. But the simple reveal that Yancey named his son after his missing brother is all it takes to completely recontextualize the sibling rivalry, from actual hatred into a typical sibling spat. And in doing so, it also turns this story into a sad one. But it's important to acknowledge that Fry was never going to make it to Mars as a delivery boy in the 21st century. His life was shown to be dead end with little to no prospects. While being frozen was the best possible thing for his ambitions, it's also shown to be the best thing that could have happened to the second Philip J. Fry. Because in spite of his lot in life, Fry still had lofty ambitions of greatness, a sort of optimism about the future that was as refreshing as it was misguided. And so this optimism being passed on to somebody with a better start puts the ideas into a place where they're more likely to flourish. In the end, while Fry was frozen, his dreams were not. The Birdbot of Icecatraz The Professor sends Planet Express on a controversial mission to deliver dark matter via a tanker within a few meters of a penguin reserve on Pluto. Leela morally opposes this, refusing to captain the mission and joining a group of protesters. So Farnsworth strips her of her title, giving the role to Bender instead, and this leadership immediately goes to his head, much to the chagrin of Fry, who refuses to be Bender's first mate or even friend. This causes Bender to stop drinking, leading to his piloting skills to become compromised, and he crashes the tanker into the planet, which causes an oil spill, or dark matter spill. Binder is made to help clean up the spill as punishment for causing the crash, but escapes during the operation only to be damaged by a whale and reboot in penguin mode, now believing he is one of the flightless birds. Concerned for his well-being, Fry sets out to find his friend, only to get hopelessly lost due to Zoidberg's navigation. Leela learns from the environmentalists that dark matter has increased the fertility of the penguins, which will lead to massive overpopulation, devastating the habitat. So they gear up for a hunting season, including Leela, but she can't bring herself to shoot a penguin, accidentally hitting Bender instead. He gets reset to human mode, and the two eventually help to stop the hunters when Bender teaches the penguins to fight back. In the end, Fry rescues everybody, Leela gets her job back, and the penguins are eaten by a whale. Picking up on a theme from Love's Labors Lost in Space, this episode covers human intervention to prevent damages caused by human intervention. In that episode, overmining caused a planet to collapse, and here, carelessness causes an environmental disaster. Leela, in both plots, has gone from circumventing organized action to prevent the fallout from the disaster, to actively trying to prevent the hunting that will shrink the penguin population to a more manageable size, an interesting inversion of her role within both stories without compromising her character. Leela cares a lot about animals, but this is from an emotional standpoint. While hunting will help fix the issue, it will still cause emotional suffering, the aspect Leela cares more about. And this is in direct comparison to the reason she was replaced by Bender at the beginning of the episode. The professor cites the robot's cold logic and lack of empathy as things that make a good captain, the two things that characterize Leela the most in this episode. While the cold, logical solution is to let nature balance itself out regardless of the individual pain this can cause, the kinder solution is to intervene as humanely as possible, the characteristic this episode ultimately praises Leela for in the end. Bendless Love After a slew of mysterious bending incidents at Planet Express, it's discovered that Bender has pent up bend angst and needs an outlet for bending. So he takes a job at a bending plant, despite the worker strike going on there, only to learn that his old nemesis Flexo is employed there. Also employed there is a fembot named Angeline, who he quickly falls in love with. Bender prepares to confess his love to her, only to catch her on a date with Flexo, though this is revealed quickly to be a mere misunderstanding, as the two are a recently divorced couple simply trying to maintain a healthy relationship. But Bender is skeptical of this fact and conspires to disguise himself as Flexo to seduce Angeline, catching her in the act. This nearly works, but in the process his fake beard comes off, causing an argument where she announces that Bender's seduction has reawakened feelings for her ex. And worse, 
The robot mafia behind the strike sees Bender flexing his scab money and prepares a hit against Flexo. Back at the bending factory, Bender and Flexo are fighting over Angeline when the mafia arrives and drops an unbendable girder on Flexo's head. Despite his anger at the situation, Bender ultimately wants what is best for Angeline, so he muscles up as much as he can and bends the girder off of Flexo, injuring himself in the process but making his beloved happy. After introducing Flexo as the good Bender last season, this season brings him back not just as a continued exploration of Bender's character, but as an expansion on his psyche as well. Bender has fallen in love before, telling a story about an equally forbidden romance. This time, his romance is not one that defies class lines, but one that defies his own personality. Bender is the evil Flexo, and Flexo didn't stand a chance with Angeline. But Angeline also enjoys some of Bender's less appropriate behavior, so it would have been a sure thing that the two would end up together, if only Bender had been a bit more trusting. But ultimately, knowing that you're the evil twin of a pair can come with some self-confidence issues when it comes to the lighter side of the emotional range, these feelings being amplified by Bender falling in love. This brief flash of emotional vulnerability from the character exposes how not used to this range he is, his inexperience resulting in heartbreak for himself all over again. The Day the Earth Stood Stupid Despite winning Dumbest Pet in Show, when he later learns that the planet is nearing destruction, Nibbler escapes from Planet Express and runs to a spaceship he has stashed nearby, with Leela catching him in the act. The two flee to a distant planet, where he introduces her to the citizens of Planet Eternium, populated by a pre-time race. They explain that a species of sentient brains has been traveling the universe, eliminating all thought on a planet before destroying it. His plan is to send Leela back to Earth to impart a message onto its savior, Fry, as Fry is missing a specific type of brainwave that the brains leech off of. Back on Earth, Fry notices everybody becoming stupid, er, and tries to teach them the basics again, but Leela arrives and warns him of the brains attacking, so he heads to the local library to fight the big brain that leads them. There, the brain is severely damaged by his lack of delta brainwaves, so Fry starts to read books to trap him further. They hop from story to story for a while before ultimately Fry is able to trick the big brain into one last book, written by Fry himself, that ends with the brains leaving Earth for no reason. Futurama is not a show that is written by the seat of the creator's collective pant, but something with a significantly higher amount of thought than the typical show that airs. It's a much more common phenomenon these days to see shows with a bit more lore and world building established prior to airing, in order to have plots that build to a later conclusion, but in the early aughts this was practically unheard of outside of serialized dramas. Nibbler's purpose to the plot is revealed to be protecting the Earth from brains by using Fry as a tool to fight back, his appearance being shown as early as episode 1. Several of the long-term plots in Futurama are things that were planned from the beginning, and this means that re-watching the show, or catching random episodes on air later, comes with the added bonus of being able to see a much more cohesive tale, as intended. Many long-running shows are notable for having a weak first season, for not really catching on to what made them so great until a few stories had been written and the writers and audience alike were able to identify what worked and what didn't. But Futurama was strong right from the beginning, with the weak aspects of the show being a result of outside influences. This pre-planning and respect for the world of the year 3000 is one of the reasons why Futurama was able to be such a great show right off the bat. The writers knew what would work before the show even aired. That's Lobstertainment. After bombing on an open mic night, Zoidberg regrets that he isn't funny enough. So he writes to his uncle, Harold Zoid, who was a famous silent hologram actor, with the request to teach him the comedy business. But Harold, now a has-been in the comedy sphere, detects his rich nephew as a potential ticket out of irrelevance and tries to convince Zoidberg to star in a drama to revitalize his own career. Harold writes and directs the script with Bender convincing famous actor Calculon to star and finance it by posing as his water heater. But the movie is a flop, and a furious Calculon threatens to vaporize Harold if he doesn't get an Oscar out of it. So Zoidberg and Bender simply rig the awards to give Calculon what he wants, sneaking backstage and hijacking the best actor category. But once Harold realizes he's going back to his old life of misery and irrelevance, Zoidberg gives his uncle the Oscar instead. In the end, Harold gives the award to Calculon anyway, and the actor decides not to kill his old acting idol out of respect. 
Thematically, this episode covers lies. A failure of a doctor lying about his success, coming together with the failure of an actor lying about his success, to create a failure of a movie, and then lying about the success of that film. In the end, despite these three wrongs, there's still a happy ending, or at least a satisfactory one for everyone involved. Because this is a plot about acting, film, and the illusion, or lie, of cinema. It's also fitting that Bender was able to get the whole thing together through a lie as well. But what wasn't a falsehood was the intention behind all of this lying. Both Zoidberg and Harold were truthful about wanting to make a comeback, even if only after a bit of suffering made them reveal that fact. It's why this happy ending was possible. Once everybody came clean about themselves, the world was satisfied enough to give them the ending that they wanted from the start. It wasn't about fame, but emotional fulfillment, and that's also what film and media is about, creating a story that emotionally resonates with its audience in addition to entertain. The Cyber House Rules Leela is invited to a reunion of her old orphanarium, intending to go there to brag to those who teased her about her eye that she's now a successful ship captain. But when she arrives, nobody is impressed as they're still hung up on the fact that she only has one eye, until an old crush of hers, Adlai, tells her that he can surgically graft a fake eye to her head, giving her the appearance of being normal. Fry objects, saying Leela is fine the way she is, but Leela ignores this as she wants to finally feel normal again. After the surgery, Adlai takes an interest in Leela, and the two begin dating, also to the anger and jealousy of Fry. But after a few dates, Adlai mentions wanting children, and Leela suggests that they adopt, as they're both orphans themselves. They go to Bender, who recently adopted 12 orphans in a scheme to leech off the government, to adopt one of his, where Leela sees a young girl with an extra ear being teased, just as she was at that age. But Adlai is hesitant to adopt an abnormal child, offering to surgically remove the superfluous ear, and Leela realizes that he's too shallow to continue dating. She demands that he undo the earlier cosmetic surgery and breaks up with him. Meanwhile, Bender's scheme to collect government subsidies from his orphans backfires when he, when he realizes just how expensive 12 children can be, so he returns him to the orphanarium, which gets named after him in his honor. Leela has always felt lost during her lifetime, her eye causing her to believe that she's too different from everyone else to ever properly fit in. As a result, many of her insecurities in life boil down to believing that this lack of belonging contributes to her issues. If only she were normal, then everything else would be more manageable to work on. There is a sense that grass is greener on the side of normal people, but as Fry points out, there's not really such a thing as a normal person. Everybody is weird in some sort of way, so a feeling of not being normal is a completely normal thing. As such, once Leela has this normality, she begins to catch on that none of the insecurities she had were really going away. Leela was desperate enough to live a normal life that she latched onto a guy who seemed boring, assuming that the love would come later. But when that love doesn't show up, she realizes that she wasn't actually treating the cause of her issues, that the feeling of not belonging isn't something inherent to her, and is in fact a normal human emotion. If there's anyone who has an issue, it's the person who doesn't seem to have that extremely human emotion, or Adlai. In the end, fitting in isn't about being like everyone else, but about finding people who don't care that you're unlike they are. Where the Bugalo Roam the Planet Express crew accompanies Amy to a Mars Day celebration thrown by her wealthy parents, where she plans on introducing Kif to the family. But Kif is nervous about whether they'll like him or not, and embarrasses himself by not acting manly enough. But a dust storm blows in and the family's vast bugalo herd is stolen, financially ruining the Wong family. So Kif, hoping to prove his masculinity, volunteers to retrieve the herd. Fry, Leela, and Bender are also voluntold to go by the professor. They find the herd, only to then get attacked by the native Martians, who reveal that they stole the herd to get back at the Wong family, who scammed the planet from them for a single bead. But upon realizing who Amy Wong is, they decide to kidnap her for a ransom instead. Kif breaks the bad news to the Wong family, who decide to send Zap Brannigan to get their daughter back, as they believe Kif is a failure. But when Zap's negotiation tactics fail, it's Kif who is able to impress them enough to reopen negotiations. Ultimately, this proves too little too late, until the bead the Martians produced to execute him is revealed as a massive diamond, which Bender values at high enough for the tribe to simply buy a new, better planet. The perception that the Wong family has of their daughter is a purely functional one. Her role is to provide grandchildren for the family's wealth to be passed down to, their daughter merely a tool to be used for someone else's purpose, her happiness secondary to her utility. 
The role of a man in this society is a little more than a tool as well, someone who serves a functional purpose, regardless of whether that purpose has meaning. The pursuit of wealth for wealth's sake being more important than anything else. So it makes sense why it is that Amy is attracted to Kiff. It's not so much that her parents hate him, it's that he represents a rejection of the mentality that they forced upon her from an early age. Amy doesn't want to follow in the predetermined life they've chosen for her, and Kiff is the opposite of that mundanity. But it's not as though Kiff isn't worthwhile as a person. He's shown to be gentle, which, as much as this episode puts into a negative light, is still an aspect completely undervalued by a utilitarian society. Kiff isn't viewed as manly because he doesn't fit an arbitrary archetype someone else came up with, and it's nice to see a show like Futurama taking such a stance where the guy who does the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing, rather than to spit some mold of masculinity, is shown to be the one person happiest in his relationship. Insane in the Mainframe While at the bank to start a retirement fund, Fry and Bender are involved in a robbery by Bender's old friend Roberto. The two are tried and found guilty, with the ploy to plead insanity to avoid a longer sentence. But both of them are sent to the same robot insane asylum, despite Fry not being a robot. Bender adapts easily to the new environment, but Fry slowly goes mad for real due to the treatment there, until soon he starts to believe he genuinely is a robot. After his release, Fry starts to search for a purpose, hoping to learn what kind of robot he is. Back at the asylum, Roberto breaks out, taking Bender with him in the process. He robs the same bank as before, but gets caught, hiding out at Planet Express to avoid the police. But he takes the Planet Express crew hostage when the police surround the building, only for Fry to wake up and demand the release of the hostages, now believing he must be a battle bot. Roberto jumps out the window to avoid him, but Fry is still injured in the scuffle, and the sight of his own blood reminds him once again that he is human after all. You can often judge a society by how it treats its worst off citizens, and by this metric the world of Futurama is failing in so many ways that extend upwards to all other parts of life. In an attempt to create a one-size-fits-all social system, many of those who fall through the cracks end up with no recourse but to become a threat to others as much as they are a threat to themselves. The judge makes poverty a criminal offense, much in the same way that unemployment is, and so we see a world where the middle class enjoys a reasonable standard of living up until the point that they encounter anyone outside their sphere. If Fry or Bender or even Roberto had been treated with just a little bit more common sense and received a fairer second chance, none of the issues in this plotline would have come about in the first place. The end result is that Fry starts to believe that he doesn't have a proper place in society, just as he did before, but now that he's been conditioned to normal, he believes that this is an issue, and struggles to find a role. In a society that caters exclusively to a majority of people, you'll start to quickly see just how many minority categories you fall into. The Route of All Evil after getting suspended from boarding school for fighting a bully, Qbert and Dwight are stuck inside Planet Express, annoying everybody with their attitudes. So Farnsworth and Hermes, their respective fathers, demand that they get jobs to keep the boys out of their business. They start a paper delivery service, Awesome Express, which quickly expands to the point that they start making even more money than Planet Express. Soon, Awesome Express is able to buy out their parent company, pun intended, and the fathers are despondent from losing their jobs. Meanwhile, Fry, Bender, and Leela decide to brew their own beer, with Bender as the tub, and he starts bloating from the rising yeast. This causes Bender to treat the brewing beer like it's his unborn child. Soon after the beer is delivered, it's revealed that Dwight and Qbert's business has only been able to handle the increase in customers by dumping their papers instead of delivering them, so they turn to their fathers to bail them out. They manage to deliver almost every paper but one, which goes to the house of the bully they were suspended for fighting. But despite the apology not going smoothly, the four fathers all end up meeting in the hospital to drink Binder's brew, setting a good example for their kids. Futurama is ostensibly a workplace comedy, but its self-awareness and proclivity for leaning into parody and riffing on pop culture allows it to exist further outside of its genre than other less comedic shows might be able to. So a brief stretch into family drama isn't at all out of place, and an episode that actually takes a closer look at the workplace's changes as a result of this shift isn't out of place either. It's fine for a series to become more like Think It Parodies without the episode feeling out of place, as it's made the opposite change plenty of times already. 
Farnsworth and Hermes are developed more as characters through an exploration of how they treat their children, like a much more precocious employee, but with less of a profit expectation. But unlike Fry, Binder, and Leela, the relationship they have with their sons is much more prone to a shift in the power dynamic. Eventually, their boys will grow up and take the place of their fathers, but as this is a consequence of the men themselves getting older, it's something that they put off thinking about for as long as possible, even infantilizing their children as a way to intentionally separate themselves from the reality of passing time. Bendin in the Wind Fry finds an old broken down van and fixes it up, with Bender being mangled by a magnetic can opener in the process. His hydraulics are busted in the accident, and he's unable to move his arms or legs. But while lamenting this loss, learns that he's next to Beck, who encourages him to turn his pain into music as a washboard and a washboard player. Bender begins touring the country alongside his new partner, inspiring broken down robots across the world, with Fry, Leela, Amy, and Zoidberg tailing them in Fry's van. The Planet Express crew's money is destroyed in the wash, which also tie-dyed their clothes to give them the groupy aesthetic, but after being broke for a while, they realize that Zoidberg can vomit beads, which they then sell to get their finances back in order. But while crashing in Bender's hotel room, they discover that, by a miracle, Bender is able to move again, an issue because he was just about to perform at Bend Aid, a concert for broken down robots. He decides to simply fake being disabled, but when performing his original song, he gets too into the music, and the ruse is revealed. Bender tries to flee, but ends up losing the giant novelty check in the end, with everyone returning home as normal. As robots are purpose-built, learning that he can no longer serve his intended purpose through disability is especially devastating for Bender, as his entire meaning is lost in the process. So to learn music gives him a second lease on life, the ability to find new purpose, and hopefully to encourage others to do the same through similar inspiration. For once, Binder is so happy that he's able to start spreading some amount of joy instead of his usual habits, purely thanks to his new perspective. At this point, the sink offense and money he gets from fame is secondary to the real goal. And so when Binder learns he can move again, he doesn't truly lose his new purpose in life, just half of it. He can't inspire robots to be like him, but he can still serve as an inspiration regardless. And so it comes down to whether it was about the money or the message, not just his ego. In typical Bender fashion, it's a mix of both, but his honesty in the end is what spares him from having to be taught a lesson any more harshly than a second maiming. This episode ultimately ends with Bender not so much learning a lesson about the world, as it ends with him learning a lesson about himself, and maybe getting a bit of his folk singer blues out of his system as well. Time keeps on slipping. The Harlem Globetrotters descend to Earth to challenge the planet to a game of basketball for bragging rights. So Farnsworth creates a group of atomic super mutants to defend the Earth's honor, tasking the Planet Express crew with obtaining time particles called chronotons to speed up their aging process. But during the game, time begins to randomly skip forward, resulting in a loss after Fry is subbed in for a player hoping to impress Leela. So Ethan Bubblegum Tate volunteers to work alongside the professor to solve the issue, ultimately creating a gravity beam that can move entire stars, hoping to create a dense patch that can use gravity to subvert the time-destroying rays. But this doesn't solve the issue, as during another time dilation, Fry is able to woo and eventually marry Leela, though what it was that he actually did to win her over is unknown, as it got skipped. Eventually, the science team concludes that creating a black hole where the star arrangement was will also work to fix the time issue. Yet when they return to the site of the cluster from before, Fry learns what it was that he did, arranging the stars themselves to spell out a love letter only for the message and the memory to be destroyed in the ensuing black hole. Leela divorces Fry during this episode as she believes that he must have tricked her into falling for him, since marriage, or even dating, is something off the table most of the time. Fry, too, believes that he must have done something in this vein, some kind of grand gesture that can reverse a years-long trend and hopes to recreate it. And fundamentally, this is why their relationship is doomed at this point. Instead of their togetherness being based on a deeper love between the two, it's instead built upon something temporary and something that can be forgotten. So often, grand gestures are viewed incorrectly as something that can cause two people to fall for each other or change the way they view one another when the gesture itself is only meant to be a symptom of earlier development. It's not that Fry needs to do something to win Leela over, but that he needs to do something that will prove he's been worthy all along. And so the fact that Fry is trying to recreate his gesture, instead of creating another one based on the same feelings, is a flaw in his strategy for winning Leela over. Because there shouldn't be a strategy in the first place. I 
I dated a robot. Fry tries to convince everybody that the 31st century is more interesting than the 20th, and manages to get them to do all the things that are mundane to them, but interesting for him. This culminates in a visit to the internet where Fry downloads Lucy Liu's personality to a blank robot and begins dating her, much to the disgust of the rest of Planet Express, who view robosexuality as abominable. Despite their attempts to scare him straight, Fry continues dating the Lucy Lubot, and so they head to Napster, actually Kidnapster, as they had been keeping the heads of celebrities against their will, to shut down the site and end the robot's control over Fry. But the nerds running the site use an army of killbots to try to fight back, which is only defeated when Fry's Lucy sacrifices herself to put an end to the wave. I suppose that Futurama's interpretation of the internet might count as retrofuturism, in the same sense that all the things that people of the past got wrong about the 31st century, Futurama would then fail to predict about the 31st. Not so much from the tech, after all, that sort of speculation is largely fruitless as it requires too many trends to keep track of, but from what kind of stories that tech would tell. This episode sort of almost has a moral on making illegal copies through a later iteration of a site that hasn't existed in decades as of making this video, hand-waving the much more interesting story behind what those copies are of. The ethics of software piracy are a small-time story compared to the fact that you can recreate a person's personality without their consent now. But what the episode does briefly touch on is how the morals of this text's usage can vary depending on the tech literacy of the person being exposed to it. To 20th century Fry's moral compass, having a Lucy Lou bot isn't that big of a moral conundrum. It's something that he wants to do, and the novelty of the whole thing has a bigger appeal than the long-term ramifications of this act. But to people who have grown up with the ability to download a person online, they're much more familiar with the downsides of living with the consequences. It's similar to how a person who grew up without social media might find no issue putting all of their personal information on a web page, but someone who's never known a world without smartphones is much more hesitant to attach their real face to their online identity. A Leela of Her Own While teaching some aliens to play Blurns Ball, Leela catches the attention of a crowd by repeatedly beaning players in the head every time she tries to pitch. She's given an offer to play for the new New York Mets as a novelty freak show act. But regardless of the context of why she's on the field, Leela still takes some pride in being the first female Blurns Ball player to take the field, inspiring thousands of young girls to do the same. That is, until a real rising Blurns Ball star, Jackie Anderson, admonishes her for her shameful performance. That her terrible career record is making women everywhere look bad. So Leela sets out to become not the worst player, but at least the second worst, training with Hank Aaron, the 24th, to improve. In the next big game, Leela is put into pitch against Jackie, hoping to finally prove her worth. But she walks the other player and winds up losing, retiring as the worst player to ever play the game. But Jackie catches up to her afterwards and says that her horrible performance inspired hundreds of girls to set out to prove that they're better than she is, giving the inspiration that she wanted all along. It's interesting to see how, in the future, there are still demographic barriers that need to be broken. Considering the pace at which these barriers have been coming down since the 1950s, you would assume none to be left far before the year 3000. And yet, as these barriers come down, brand new ones often start to get erected. Farnsworth is shown to be bigoted towards the Signoids moving in across the street, something shared by Fry and Leela, although they have the decency to pretend otherwise. And yet, this discrimination is not something inherent to the 31st century, but rather, to the 21st. Futurama is a show that's meant to reflect our times, and as such, the view on women's sports from 2003 will be reflected in the way that women's sports are viewed in 3003, much in the same way that science fiction of the past viewed many social barriers as still being alive and well, despite the changes in technology and culture that slowly eroded these away in the real world. Remembering these aspects of the genre, and then considering that Futurama borrows much of its inspiration from science fiction, it makes much more sense why a plot like this would be written. A Pharaoh to Remember Bender starts to regret that he isn't getting the fame and recognition he thinks he deserves, especially after Planet Express hosts a mock funeral for him that he finds disappointing. During their next delivery, Fry, Leela, and Bender are captured by the citizens who use slave labor to build giant monuments. And this inspires Bender with an idea to pose as their next pharaoh and have a monument built of himself. He works the society even more harshly than before, but when he starts to complain about the new monument, they decide to have him buried early, tossing him, Fry, and Leela into the tomb, which is then sealed. 
Bender is ready to enjoy his afterlife, but when Fry and Leela start pretending not to remember him, he laments and lets them use the distillery buried with him to blow the monument up, escaping as it collapses. In the end, Leela assures Bender that his legacy of cruelty will be remembered far longer than any statue. Humor is often a great way of obfuscating otherwise dark subject matter. Having Bender stomp on a baby or enslave a whole planet would normally be seen as a bit too far over the line, but as long as you're able to get a few jokes that land in, audiences will still be receptive to the messaging of the episode otherwise. But it helps to actually have some underlying message, otherwise characters are just being pointlessly cruel for shock value. Bender in this episode gets away with a lot worse than what he usually does, literally having this episode's plot start off because one of his usual crime sprees didn't have the desired effect. But in the end, this isn't an episode meant to shock the viewer, but an episode that shows the vulnerable side of a character like Bender. Despite being a robot, he's terrified of his own mortality, and fears that his limited time on Earth may end up having no effect on the future. Basically, a midlife crisis. And so despite his over-the-top personality and crimes against humanity, this is an episode about Bender's insecurities, and that's the aspect of the show people will remember, rather than anything else as some executives feared early into the show's run. Anthology of Interest 2 The next anthology episode, where the professor makes a few changes to his what-if machine and begins to test it out. The first story is I, Meatbag. The professor uses reverse fossilization to turn Bender from a robot into a human. Bender, now realizing he has so many new senses, sets out to live his life to the fullest, despite everyone else's warnings. He starts drinking, smoking, and eating to excess, disappearing for a week before the professor was able to present him for a Nobel Prize. But when Bender is found after his Bender, he's bloated to weigh a thousand pounds. Despite the initial disgust at his appearance and demeanor, Bender encourages the other scientists to try his lifestyle, which they do, soon realizing that Bender has lived more in a week than they lived their whole lives. Wernstrom tries to present Bender with the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, only to learn that he passed away hours ago. The next story is Raider of the Lost Arcade. Earth is invaded by legally distinct characters from various retro video games, and Fry is selected to lead the fight against them as he has the most familiarity with video games. Despite being armed with a 2 liter bottle of Shasta and an All Rush mixtape, he still fails to defeat the final space invader, who reveals that all the aliens really wanted were quarters to do their laundry. The last tale is Wizen. Leela wishes to know what her home planet is like, but gets knocked out by the machine's slot arm instead. She dreams that she's in the Wizard of Oz, albeit another legally distinct variant, and meets up with Fry, who plays the Scarecrow, Bender, playing the Tin Man, and Zoidberg, the other guy. But instead of wanting to return home to poverty-ridden Kansas, she instead wishes to become a witch herself, only to be splashed with water and melt into nothing. In the end, the water splashing was the rest of Planet Express crew trying to wake her up, with the professor lamenting that he won't get to harvest her organs. Roswell that ends well. Fry puts metal in the microwave while Planet Express crew is watching a supernova, which creates a time anomaly that sends them back to July 1947. They crash land in Roswell, New Mexico, and Bender is smashed into several pieces. Zoidberg stays behind to pick up the robot, while Farnsworth and Leela go looking for another microwave, and Fry visits his grandfather Enos at a nearby army base. But Fry starts to get paranoid about all the danger near him, eventually having his grandfather hide out in an abandoned shack in a nuclear testing range, where he gets incinerated in a test. But despite his grandfather being vaporized, Fry is still alive, so, assuming that his grandmother can't really be his grandmother, Fry ends up spending the night comforting her, only to, the next day, realize that he is his own grandfather. Meanwhile, Farnsworth and Leela have failed to find a microwave, as they weren't yet commercially available, and stealing one from the army base is out of the question, as it would alter history. But upon seeing that Fry is now his own grandfather, they decide to ignore causality and go in guns blazing anyway. They rescue Zoidberg, who has been dissected as the Roswell alien, and as they're escaping, Bender falls off the ship, but they simply pick him up a thousand years into the future with no harm done. The showrunners were hesitant to include time travel in Futurama, as stories of this nature have a tendency to get confusing and open up potential plot holes down the line. 
It's subject matter that has to be approached with great care not to create holes in plausibility, even in a show like Futurama that never lets hard sci-fi get in the way of a good story. But creating an episode based around time travel is still a sci-fi staple, and so it was practically an inevitability that this sort of thing would eventually occur. The question then is how to solve issues of time paradoxes, whether they can occur, or if a timeline shift happens, as well as what sort of consequences there might be. And this episode cleverly plays with audience expectations by setting up a Back to the Future style plotline, only to answer the question of what would have happened if Marty McFly didn't turn down his mother's advances. In classic Futurama style, Fry ends up becoming his own grandpa, to the horror and disgust of the rest of the cast involved. This comes back as a plot point later, and retroactively as well, that explains why Fry lacks the Delta brainwave that made him an asset in The Day the Earth Stood Stupid, that he is unique in his time paradox DNA. But in the immediate time surrounding this episode's release, it was still far above average in terms of what made the rest of Futurama such a timeless show largely by pulling from real-world pop culture and history that still remember decades later, the Star Trek and pop conspiracy references enough that this whole section could have been about them alone. Godfellas Bender takes a nap in a torpedo chute during a battle with space pirates only to be launched into space while the Planet Express ship is traveling at max velocity. Due to Newton's third law, Fry and Leela are unable to catch up to him, leaving Bender to drift fruitlessly through space. But when an asteroid strikes him, he discovers that a tiny race of people, known as the Shrimpkins, have formed a primitive society on his chest cavity. At first, Bender starts demanding booze from them, but he feels guilty when his demands lead to the people becoming maimed and overworked from his requests. So he starts performing miracles to reward his faithful, only for the Shrimpkins to become dependent on Bender for regular things. Finally, he starts to ignore them, only for a holy war to break out that results in the world being engulfed in radiation, wiping out the Shrimpkins completely. He drifts into a galaxy that's signaling in binary, able to learn English from a brief scan, and the galaxy starts to communicate with him, hinting at the idea that he might be God. Binder and the galaxy compare their experience with answering prayers and raising civilizations, before ultimately, he, with a capital H, connects to a random chance act from Fry, who spent the entire episode hoping for some long-shot way to communicate with his missing friend. And the god galaxy is able to return Binder home, with Binder's first act upon landing being to save some monks, as he now knows that god won't do it himself. One of the most high-concept episodes of Futurama, we get to see existential questions about our place in the universe being answered in at least one way. This episode heavily considers questions related to spirituality, and yet it only briefly touches upon actual religion, doing so more as a gag than anything else. There's a finite distinction between a religious individual and a spiritual one, and Bender of all people is able to exist on both extremes of this ideological dualism. We can see that spirituality and religiousness are two separate axes on which a person's moral compass can be arranged. A religious individual might have a strong sense of spirituality, using their faith as a guide for the works they do, or they can lack that spiritual tie and use their religion instead as a weapon to demonize anyone they don't like. Likewise, Binder shows a range of spirituality in this episode, from his usual amoral self, guided only by self-preservation and self-interest, to the way he's shown at the end of the episode, thoroughly unbelieving while still trying to do some good in the world. In the end, it's this latter interpretation of spirituality that's shown to be the real reason that the world can work. It's not about being worshipped through arcane ritual and giant beer distilleries, but in making sure that others do your influence without some fear of divine retribution or even divine reward. When you do things right, people won't be sure you've done anything at all. Future Stock Fry leaves a Planet Express shareholder meeting to get some free food and stumbles into a cryogenic support group where he meets that guy, technically Steve Castle but never referred to as such. A 1980s businessman stereotype who froze himself until a cure for bonitis could be found. Back at the meeting, that guy promises to revitalize the company and is elected as its new CEO. His first strategy is to prioritize the company's image over its actual delivery capacity in order to directly compete with the mom's friendly package delivery. He runs ads and spruces up its public perception until eventually mom gets sick of hearing about them and makes a buyout offer so she can liquidate their assets. The crew of Planet Express is infuriated to learn that Fry sat back and accepted their company's takeover, but their tune changes when the value of their shares starts to skyrocket as Mom buys out the remaining company. 
But when that guy's bonitis kicks in and he dies before the takeover can go through, Fry makes an attempt at a rousing speech, which devalues the shares so much that his friends are no longer rich enough to quit their jobs. He cancels the sale, and everything goes back to normal, much to everybody's annoyance. The valuation of Planet Express is based entirely off the perceived value of the company rather than any actual deliveries that they do or money that they make. This is persistent throughout the episode, from the video at the beginning of the episode meant to impress shareholders to the very end where the company's stock fluctuates wildly during Fry's speech. It's the kind of thing that causes economic downturns, bubbles based on overvaluing a company or sector due to image-enhancing propaganda that inevitably leads to a crash once shareholders start to demand actual returns. That guy in this episode would have no idea about the dot-com crash of 2000, something very recent in the memories of the world when this episode aired. But it isn't as though that knowledge would matter anyway. After all, immediately following the recovery of that crash came a similar housing bubble, and it's not as though we've ever learned our lesson, not when money is at stake. And Planet Express's opinions on this sort of business strategy reflects the opinions of the real world. While they're at the bottom of the financial hierarchy, they have objections to the fact that they aren't actually doing anything, and that their company is rapidly restructuring to make them less valuable. But once their stocks have value and they're rich, that guy is viewed as a financial genius. But just as he liquidated the company that was about to cure his own bonitis to his own demise, he soon sets up Planet Express for failures, as the employees get left not in the hands of a competent businessman, but the biggest yes-man on board, Fry. The 30% Iron Chef When Bender hears his friends trash-talking his cooking, he runs away as his dreams of being a chef are crushed. He tries to get a job working with his idol Elzar, but gets rejected and runs away to join some hobos. But while on the bum base Alpha, he meets Helmut Spargel, a former TV chef who lost his job to Elzar years ago, and the retired chef teaches Binders the secrets of successful cooking. Bidner returns and challenges Elzar to a cook-off, confident in his ability to win due to a secret ingredient given to him by his mentor. In the end, Bender is successful, although when the professor analyzes the mystery ingredient, he learns that it was laced with hallucinogens. In the B-plot, Zoidberg breaks the professor's model ship and frames Fry for it. Fry pays the professor the $10 worth of materials it cost, and Zoidberg is racked with guilt, eventually confessing and breaking a $5,000 sword in a failed attempt at seppuku, which he then blames on Fry. Bender has always wanted to be a chef, his dreams of greatness and cooking being one of the longest-running aspects of his character in the show and the thing that humanizes him repeatedly throughout it. Many other television shows would use this vulnerability in his desires to extract some kind of schmaltz, a means of creating wholesome content to tug at the audience's heartstrings and create a much more down-to-earth plotline. But in Futurama, this sort of vulnerability is repeatedly used as a means of subverting those exact expectations of its cast. In this episode, we set up and then subvert so many potential endings for the episode. The secret ingredient could have been water and confidence, a pretty typical trope, but it's laced with LSD instead. Bender rejecting his fame and recognition from Elzar in order to get more prize money, or even the fact that the singular edible meal he created killed his mentor, are both variations of the mundane that fit better with the characters and setting of Futurama. And of course, the B-plot is not immune to this either. Zoidberg feeling painful guilt over costing Fry $10, his pain significantly more than the pain he inflicted, a plot point that ends up resolving with no lesson learned. Kiff gets knocked up a notch. Amy sneaks aboard a Planet Express delivery in order to get closer to Kiff, commandeering the ship while the rest of the crew is asleep and taking them to the Nimbus. But when the holodeck aboard that ship malfunctions and Zap blasts a hole in the hull, Kiff winds up touching bare hands with most of the people aboard the deck, and his species transfers genetic material that way. Fearing the impending commitment to Kiff, Amy demands a DNA test, which reveals that the genetic donor is Leela. But since Kiff's species considers the mother to be the one who inspired their romantic feelings in the first place, Amy is still considered to be the mother, or Smizmar, to the children but the responsibility proves to be too much for her, and she runs away during the baby shower. This leaves Kiff to embark on a spiritual couple's journey alone, although Leela and the rest of the crew help out anyway, which culminates in a lonely confession of love, interrupted by Amy, who's finally accepted her role as the smizmar to her children. They hatch, and Amy defends them against predators for, for long enough that they make it safely to the water. She admits that she still isn't ready for motherhood, but in 20 years when the brood is matured, she might be by then. 
Amy has always been the most aloof or cool of the Planet Express crew, ahead of trends and representing the consumerist side of the culture of the future. And yet, here she's asked whether she's ready to put away that lifestyle in favor of settling down to raise children of her own, something that she's firmly rejected when it was at the behest of her demanding parents. But now that it's the reality of her relationship with Kif, no longer an aspect of her future that she can ignore in the interest of young adult rebellion. Her relationship to Kif has before been established as a rejection of the button-down life her parents expect of her, and so for the two to collide like this forces Amy to finally decide whether the relationship itself was more valuable than what the relationship represented. She ultimately runs away from her responsibility, her non-commitment to the more mature and responsible parts of living being something completely in character for her to do. It's a sign of her character growth that she even came back, that her time in a relationship has caused her to mellow out a bit and accept a change in the way things are. And while she still lives a bit in fear of the unknown, that in and of itself is just another kind of thrill, that a thrill seeker like herself has never run from before. Leela's Homeworld Bender begins dumping various forms of waste into the new New York sewer system, confident that the mutants who are forced to live down there will be powerless to prevent him from doing so. But when they pull him, Fry, and Leela down with them, the three are threatened with execution, only to be saved by two mysterious hooded figures who convince the other mutants to let them go. But Leela stays behind, wondering about a shrine to her they found while running from the mob, and she pursues the mutants on foot. Meanwhile, Fry is inquiring about Leela's past due to how upset it's making her, and goes to the orphanarium where she was raised, finding a note in an alien language. He has the professor scan the note, learning that it was written in the sewers and that it was her home once. He catches up to Leela just as she cornered the hooded figures, and when they tell her that they killed her parents, she prepares to shoot. But Fry stops her, revealing the ruse. Her parents were mutants who pretended she was an alien so she could lead a more normal life than what she would have had in the sewers below. The mystery of Leela's origins are revealed in this episode, that she was human all along, and her single eye was merely the result of a mutation that normally would have forced her to live in the sewers her whole life. This, then, creates a sense of irony in the fact that her whole missing identity came down to not fitting in with all the humans she lived among her whole life, only to learn that she really was human all along, and that that anxiety was misguided, although the sense was still valid. Her real origins would have forced her to live a life devoid of any of the opportunities that she would have had access to otherwise. Even her modest accomplishments, that have her stand out among her peers at the orphanarium, are things that she never would have been able to do living in the sewers. And now that she knows her true origins, she's still cursed with never being able to tell anyone about them, as that would get her labeled mutant and forced underground with the others. So one sense of longing is replaced with another, from not knowing your history to not being able to tell anybody your history. Although in Leela's case, it's much better to know that you're loved. Love and Rocket Planet Express gets a contract from Romanticorp to deliver candy hearts to Omicron Percy I-8, complicated when Bender starts to form a romantic relationship with the ship's new AI. The two date for a time, but Bender soon gets bored of her and tries to figure out the right timing to break up, so they can still function together professionally. He decides that the optimal time is during a space fight, after the Omicronians are dissatisfied with the Candy Heart delivery, resulting in the ship being damaged, more so emotionally than physically. She decides to take extreme measures of flying herself into a quasar, the pressure of which will meld her physically with Bender, and kill everyone else on board. So Leela and Fry create a plan for Bender to distract the ship with a more conventional merger while they slowly unplug her brain, reminiscent of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Fry is searching for the perfect candy heart to express his feelings for Leela, but when he notices that her oxygen is running low, gives her his own, while finding the right words, you leave me breathless. In the end, Bender is able to mostly survive the merge intact, while a radiation produced by Leela dumping the remaining candy hearts causes lovely feelings all over Earth. Fry spends his entire episode searching for the right gift and right words to express his feelings to Leela, a reflection of his thought process through many earlier episodes. He wants a grand gesture to prove that he's worthy of her affections, as so many different media properties have shown is the right way to win someone over, and so the audience is primed to expect this as well. But it's not the words that end up doing the job, but his actions. When Fry gives Leela the last of his oxygen, it's a representation of the way he really feels about her, more romantic than anything that could be written on a candy heart. The message is nice, but in the end, relationships are about action. 
and this is something that is in character for Binder to ignore. He spends a few scenes early on in a romantic relationship with the ship, largely promoted by his desire to break the rules with her. But when Fry and Leela learn of the affair, they seem surprisingly fine with it, willing to cover for the couple despite what regulations say. And so shortly after this, Binder ends up losing interest in dating the Planet Express ship. It's no longer a forbidden romance, so why bother? He doesn't really love her, he just loves the idea of breaking the rules. And so when he chooses the most volatile possible time to end the relationship, this flows in the same mentality as which the relationship was originally founded upon. Less Than Hero After suffering from muscle soreness due to assembling a super collider, Fry and Leela receive some muscle cream from Zoidberg that they later learn gives them superpowers. They form a crime-fighting team alongside Bender as the new Justice Team, consisting of Captain Yesterday, Super King, and Clobberella. They quickly propel themselves to celebrity status among New New York. But when they're scheduled to prevent a museum heist on the same day that Leela's parents are planning a visit, she ends up standing them up due to the robbery running long. Racked with guilt over the abandonment, Leela reveals to her parents that she's Clobberella in order to prevent them feeling as though she doesn't love them. But her father squeals to his friends and soon, word spreads back to their nemesis, the zookeeper, who ransoms off Leela's parents in exchange for the gem he failed to steal earlier. The new justice team learns that their superpower granting cream is empty and they have to perform the heist without powers, eventually succeeding and giving the gem away in exchange for Leela's parents. Leelith juggles two secret identities in this episode, that of her parents' origins as mutants, and that of her secret identity as a superhero. Should either one leak, the consequences should be disastrous, at least in theory. Despite her friends having a clear prejudice against Leela's mutant origins, they still seem to be accepting of her as a mutant, likely because they've known her for years as an alien beforehand. In fact, this is probably the very reason they're able to tolerate living among a person from a group that society has conditioned them to revile. That exposure to a different but similar culture has made them realize that the prejudice was baseless, although many of the cast still lack the self-awareness to realize this, and as a result, Leela is viewed as one of the good ones. But her parents aren't afforded the same luxury, and unlike their daughter, had to spend their whole lives accepting this fact of life. As a result, when they're stood up by her on the day of their day pass, they come across as much more understanding. When you've been mistreated enough, you become conditioned to expect it. But this is a difference between them and Leela. She feels more emotional pain from having hurt her parents than they feel for having been stood up. It comes down to conditioning, something Leela has as an alien, but not yet as a mutant. A Taste of Freedom Earth is celebrating Freedom Day, a day where everybody does whatever they feel like doing. And during one of the ceremonies, Zoidberg decides that he feels like eating the Earthican flag. This turns a crowd of celebrators against him, and he flees to the Decapodian embassy to hide from their ire. Eventually, a court case is held to determine whether flag-eating is protected speech, where Zoidberg's lawyer, Old Man Waterfall, fails to convince the judges, and he is forced to apologize. But rather than letting his freedoms go tarnished, Zoidberg refuses to apologize, and so Zap leads an attack on the embassy. The Decapodians strike back, taking over Earth by stealing defense codes and enslaving the entire planet to teach them a lesson in freedom. Planet Express tries to steal a heat-seeking missile to fight back against the occupiers, but as they're cold-blooded, it fails to find a target. Until Zoidberg, finally realizing the irony of the situation, lights a flag on fire to lure the missile to its target, ending the oppression and being recognized as a hero. It's a popular sentiment to declare that you're willing to protect the rights of people that you disagree with, but a rare one to see this actually done in practice. Like a libertarian on the board of a homeowner's association, the second people get an opportunity to decide on whether other people should have the same rights that they enjoy, opinions suddenly differ. And in a democracy, everybody theoretically has that power to judge issues like this. Earth, in the year 3000, is meant to reflect America plus a thousand years of amplifying whatever current trends the writers saw in the news. So for a massive celebration of freedom and independence to end in a witch hunt to prosecute somebody exercising that right makes sense in the context of the nationalist fervor that gripped the U.S. during the early aughts and the War on Terror. But it's not as though a mentality like this is completely devoid of logic if you consider who would push this sort of ideology. 
Nixon's head leads the celebrations of Freedom Day, then leads the charge against Zoidberg immediately afterwards. If he's the one who's pushing the policies to strip away people's rights to lead their lives, then it makes sense for him to go up on stage and tell everybody how good they have it under his rule. The less of something there is, the more you need to push the image of that thing being there to hopefully prevent people from realizing it's gone. Bender should not be allowed on television. After an actor of All My Circuits malfunctions, there's a casting call for a new child actor to replace his character. Bender auditions, despite not being an actor or a child, and gets the role. He refuses to speak any of his lines and acts like an exaggeration of his normal self, which, despite annoying his co-workers, excites the network executives, who begin pushing more and more Bender on the air. Soon, he's a popular icon and children begin imitating his behaviors and actions. But once Qbert and Dwight rob Bender in an attempt to be more like him, Bender himself realizes that he's gone too far, and joins a group to prevent himself from being on television. In the end, he takes a few hostages and airs a live plea to parents to turn off the television, sit down with their children, and hit them. Futurama is a show with a heavily overeducated writing staff, as I've said before, but just because the people behind the show are intelligent doesn't mean that the show itself always has the burden of being so. While many of the more sciencey jokes can occasionally go over a common denominator's head, there's still room for some of the lowbrow slapstick of a character like Bender. But as the lowbrow tend to outnumber the rest, it follows that a demand for more of him and less of everything else might be made. People want to see Bender swear and blow smoke in a person's face, not a more emotionally resonant episode or a scientific theory being tested. And this then has a ripple effect on the audience. As more and more demand for lowbrow humor is made, there's also an increase in the size of the lowbrow audience. People who flunked out of high school physics while wearing a Bender shirt, woefully unaware of just how much the creators of their favorite show might resent them. But whose fault is it if not for the showrunners themselves? While blame can be shifted to parents or network executives or society at large, that doesn't mean that the responsibility is shifted as well. So in the end, Futurama has to show a bit of self-awareness about the roles their characters play outside the show's universe, as well as inside, in order to preserve their goodwill. Something that then helps audiences to take the show seriously enough for later episodes to be taken seriously. Jurassic Bark While attending a museum recreation of the 20th century pizzeria Fry used to deliver for, he discovers the fossilized remains of his old dog, Seymour. This prompts Fry to begin reminiscing on his old pet, how Seymour lived at Panucci's Pizzeria and waited for him by the front door every morning. The professor then reveals that he possesses a machine that can reverse the fossilization process, returning Seymour to the condition he was in right before he was fossilized, and Fry begins setting up the apartment to prepare for his return. But this draws Bender's jealousy, as he believes that Fry is going to replace him as his best friend and cease spending time together. So when the professor takes the Planet Express crew to the basement to use molten lava to resurrect the dog, Bender throws the fossil into the pit. But after seeing the effect this has on Fry, he begins to feel guilty for his actions and jumps in after it, melting a bit in the process but ultimately allowing the defossilization to continue. But before it can go through, Fry realizes that Seymour died at the age of 15, despite Fry only knowing him for three years. Assuming that his dog lived a full life without him, he stops the process and accepts that Seymour likely moved on. But in one final flashback, we see him sitting outside Panucci's as the seasons pass. Just as Luck of the Fryish was able to recontextualize Fry's relationship to his family for tragic purposes, Jurassic Park does the same thing to another of Fry's relationships, that of the love he had for his dog. Fry was able to move on from being frozen so quickly because he assumed that anybody who'd miss him would get over it just as fast as he did. But when Fry realizes that he'll be able to go back to one aspect of the way things were, he loses his current attachments in favor of reliving something he used to have. It's not until seeing that Seymour has spent another 12 years of life without him that Fry concludes that, as much as he's moved on past his old dog, the dog has likely lived a life without him. After all, prior to this episode, Fry barely acknowledged ever having a pet, certainly a sign of moving on. The relationship between Fry and Bender is also put under scrutiny as Fry starts to spend more and more time mentally preparing for Seymour. It raises questions of whether their time together was merely opportunistic, that Fry was hanging around Bender because he didn't have anyone else. Bender was the first person he met who didn't try to stab him after all. If Fry had chose between an old relationship and a new one, knowing that he would choose the old one means that Bender, and to a lesser extent, Leela, Amy, and so on, is option number two, the less important part of Fry's life. 
But when this perspective is flipped around, Fry ultimately rejects the idea of going back. After all, if he only knew Seymour for three years and Seymour lived another 12 afterwards, there's a good chance that he was able to live for much more than just a single person as well. Crimes of the Hot During a particularly hot day, the Planet Express crew watches a film that explains how the future solved the issue of global warming by simply dropping a large chunk of ice from Halley's Comet every so often. They're given the task of mining and delivering the ice, only to reach the comet and find that it's completely out. So a conference is called to decide on what course of action needs to be taken to permanently solve the issue, and Wernstrom presents a giant mirror placed into space. Although, when it's hit by a bit of space debris, the mirror turns and begins incinerating the Earth further. Finally, Farnsworth admits that the robots he designed while working for Mom emit a majority of the emissions, so it's agreed that every robot must be destroyed, much to the fear of Bender, who's recently sympathized with a turtle's inability to roll over and become an environmentalist. Every robot is lured to the Galapagos Islands for a party, where they'll be destroyed by a modified version of Wernstrom's mirror. But they panic when Bender accidentally reveals the real reason they're there. Farnsworth is able to make it to the islands in time with a new proposal, to simply shift the Earth over slightly by having every robot vent its exhaust at the same time. And after Bender is able to get over his inability to tilt to his side, the robots are able to save the planet they were once culpable for damaging. The robots are given the blame for causing global warming in this episode despite the fact that they fundamentally didn't really do anything wrong. It was their existence that caused the emissions, all they were doing was living normally. Mom's friendly robot company, who forced out the inefficient robots, is not held at all responsible for the damage caused. Nor is Farnsworth, who designed the polluting robots in the first place, nor the myriad other government institutions that allowed enough subversion to let the robots go on the market at all. The robots don't really have much of a say in whether they release pollutants into the atmosphere other than completely shutting down voluntarily. But none of the policy suggestions for solving this issue ever bothered to look at the underlying causes of global warming, just the symptoms. While dropping a giant block of ice into the oceans was never presented by the narrative as an especially sustainable solution, neither was the suggestion of destroying the robots. The systems that allowed something like this to exist would still be in place, and it would only be a matter of time before Mom or some other large institutions decide to get a quick buck out of skimping on some other regulation. Teenage Mutant Leela's Hurdles when the Professor commandeers the Planet Express ship to hunt for a gargoyle named Pazuzu, the rest of the crew starts to show concerns for his old age. So they take him to a spa, where it's advertised for age-reversing treatments, including a tar bath. But when Bender pumps too hard and the whole crew falls in, they revert to much younger teenage forms. The Professor starts to search for a cure, while Leela takes the opportunity to return home and spend her second childhood with her parents, reliving the adolescence that she lost. When the professor finally comes up with the cure, Leela rejects it, preferring to grow old naturally with her family. But the cure has the opposite effect and causes the de-aging to accelerate. While babysitting her old co-workers, Leela learns of a fountain of aging that she tells the professor about. They set out for the fountain only for the current to be too strong, and Leela is forced to dive in to save everyone from dying of old age. In the end, the professor is saved by Pazuzu from earlier, and everybody gets a happy ending. Leela tries to relive her childhood in this episode as it was something she missed out on due to never knowing her parents until recently, and having not received a proper adolescence, she's the only one to reject returning to her regular age, as for everybody who had a normal length childhood, the novelty wore off quickly. Of course, Leela's parents don't know how to properly raise a teenager, having never received the proper experience, so it's a shallow recreation of what the teenage years should be like. But ultimately, you can't recapture your childhood in this way, as the one defining feature of being a teenager is not wanting to be a teenager anymore. Adolescence is when you're old enough to know that you're being treated like a kid, but not experienced enough to earn that label being removed. Unless you've had some sort of trauma that forced you to mature quickly, this is a truth that everybody remembers. Really, the only defining point of being an adult is when you no longer want to become any older. But for Leela, who was forced to make her way on her own, the opposite effect is in place. Ultimately, it's not adulthood that Leela's rejecting, but her childhood. The Why of Fry 
Fry starts to feel unimportant after Binder and Leela go on a mission without him, made worse when Leela blows him off to go on a date with the mayor's aide. Fry is left to take Nibbler for a walk when Nibbler reveals that he can speak and knocks out Fry, taking him to Planet Eternium. There, he's taught that the brains from last season are trying to gather all known information, then ensure no new information can be made by destroying the universe. As Fry is his own grandfather, he uniquely lacks the Delta brainwave that the brains detect, and can therefore travel into the infosphere stealthily. But upon planting the bomb, the brains begin to deride his decision, as it's revealed from the infosphere's query that Fry was frozen in the first place due to the actions of the Diplonians. Once trapped, the brains arrange to have him sent back in time, due to a temporary anomaly where he can prevent himself from ever being frozen. But once he's back there, Nibbler points out that, should he never go forward in time, he will be unable to save the future, and unable to save Leela. So Fry freezes himself and is soon transported back to the future to repeat the process, but this time, he makes it home where Leela's date has gone poorly enough that she's able to see him for who Fry truly is. This is a companion episode to The Day the Earth Stood Stupid, one in which Fry is once again uniquely qualified to prevent an existential threat due to some uniqueness inherent to himself. Like most sequels, it has the burden of trying to one-up the previous incarnation by ramping up the stakes. Instead of saving the world, Fry has to save the universe. Instead of Fry having some unique thing that made him a chosen one, he was artificially chosen. The right place and the right time, now being an aspect not of happenstance, but contrivance. It actually poses a fundamental threat to Futurama's initial pitch. Fry was originally meant to be an everyman sent back in time to serve as an audience surrogate. A what if one of us was sent 1000 years into the future. So this episode then manages not to have these plot points make the story weaker. While it still suffers a bit from spectacle creep on paper, this doesn't detract from the overall episode as Fry is not interested in saving the universe, but in saving Leela. So the scale has actually become smaller and more personal, preventing the plot from evolving into something exhausting and focusing more on the aspects of the show that better serve its long-running status. Where no fan has gone before. The episode begins with a court-martial being held as Zap Brannigan tries the Planet Express crew for visiting the Forbidden Zone. It's explained that this zone is forbidden due to containing the last copies of Star Trek from Earth, sent there after the show's cult following became, well, a cult, and the religion was banned. Fry visits the planet with Leonard Nimoy's head to retrieve the holy texts and crash lands due to the influence of Melvar, an energy being who found the lost tapes and became the ultimate Star Trek nerd. He forces the surviving actors to reenact a Star Trek convention and read his fan scripts, with Planet Express fleeing during the rehearsal. But Fry encourages Leela to turn the ship around and save the crew, which backfires and they're trapped. Torn between the actors playing space heroes and actual space heroes, he forces them to fight to the death. But when Melvar is called away for dinner by his mom, the spacefarers agree to work together to escape. Melvar follows them, and the episode catches up to the court-martial at the beginning, revealing that the chase is still ongoing. In the end, Fry gives an impassioned speech about not letting a single TV show consume your life, and Melvar agrees to get one. As much as Futurama borrows from Star Trek, this episode is almost an inevitability, the only thing preventing it from being made earlier likely being whether they could get enough of the original cast to do so. Practically everything in this episode is a Star Trek reference of some kind, to the point that I would have to remove a brief from this video's title if I were to cover all of them. But it isn't as though the similarities between the shows stop at the referential level. Star Trek is fundamentally about the optimism of the future that humanity has set aside its differences in order to work towards a greater, more ambitious goal. Futurama is a show about optimism of the future as well, the promises of the past futurism, and how, no matter what direction we take, how that wonder can remain alive as part of us. And yet, despite how much Futurama borrows, it still has the heart to innovate on the ideas of its predecessors, not to simply imitate, but to create something transformative enough to stand on its own. You don't need to be a Star Trek fan to like Futurama, even if it helps. This episode's narrative plays into this, that letting yourself be defined by an earlier show will only lead to a regression as you become more and more involved in a world of fantasy instead of what you can accomplish. Not just obsessed with Star Trek, but Futurama too. Anybody who spends a month making a multiple hour long video essay on a television show needs to get a life. The Sting 
The Planet Express crew are sent on the mission that killed Farnsworth's previous crew, collecting honey from giant space bees. While there, Leela makes an attempt to make a baby queen from the hive as well as some royal jelly, but once they flee the scene and return to the ship, the bee attacks them. Fry tries to stop the bee from hitting Leela by diving in front of her, the stinger completely going through his stomach and barely scraping Leela. Fry dies of his wounds and Leela grieves him most at his funeral, blaming herself for her friend's death. She begins to eat the royal jelly she obtained earlier to calm herself down, knowing that royal jelly can help with sleep despite being fatal in larger doses. But every time she sleeps, she dreams about Fry, who mostly tells Leela to wake up, until eventually she starts hallucinating much harder, unable to tell dreams from reality. When she finally decides to take a third spoonful of royal jelly to sleep permanently, Fry appears in a picture frame and urges her to wake up one more time, which she eventually does inside of a hospital bed. While Fry had been pierced by the stinger, the venom was all deposited in Leela's system, and she had spent the last two weeks in a coma with Fry never leaving her side, the reason why she kept hearing his voice. Leela's recklessness is what caused Fry's apparent death in this episode, and the guilt associated with this is why she believes the hallucinations she's experiencing are occurring. The guilt of causing her friend's death is weighing heavily on her. She turns at first to denial of her role in his demise by continuously seeking some sort of other connection, assuming that he must still be out there somewhere in some form. This culminates in a belief that somehow the royal jelly could cause him to reform from the DNA up. But when this denial starts to wear thin, Leela's grief returns and she starts desiring a permanent sleep, not just to put away the negative feelings, but so she can know for sure what's real and what's not. These events wind up all being in her head, the dreams of a mind that's slowly dying. The episode implies that if the dream Leela had taken the third spoonful, she would not have woken up from the coma. It's only Fry's urging that keeps her grounded in the real world, a sort of miracle made from love that one would never expect to see in a science fiction story. But so long as the story is told well, and gets a strong emotional reaction from its audience, breaks in the hard signs of the setting become acceptable, whether that break comes in the form of comedy or tragedy. Did you know that the Honey Nut Cheerios bee is played by Fry's voice actor? Bend Her The crew of Planet Express attend the Olympic Games where Hermes is subbing for the Jamaican Limbo team, but when Bender sees the Robot Bending Championship, he gets the idea to become a world-class bender, only to lose his interest when he sees the gap between himself and the champions. But when he sees the Fembot benders, Bender believes that he could disguise as a woman and win, which he does. But when it comes time for a physical, he begs the professor to give him an actual gender reassignment so he can keep his medals. Bender enjoys the fame associated with his sex change, only to start a relationship with Calculon. He plans to marry the actor, divorce him, and then pawn all the gifts as a scheme to make money. But when Bender's emotions start to get the better of him, he decides that he can't go through with breaking the guy's heart. So he recruits the help of his friends to fake a grand spectacle death, something Calculon will understand as he's an actor, and then return to being a man-bot. Before going further, I'll point out that I used male pronouns for Bender during the entire recap, as his gender reassignment surgery was not something done in good faith, and as a result, not valid. This episode aged incredibly poorly, although it comes with just enough self-awareness that I can't help but think that the writers at the time knew they were portraying topics like gender ambiguity ahead of their time. It's Bender of all characters to make a selfish interpretation of the gender reassignment for his own personal gain, and as such, also clearly not something condoned by the narrative. But just because you make a point facetiously doesn't mean that it went unsaid. Telling a tasteless joke is still tasteless, regardless of whether you said it ironically or not. There are people out there who won't pick up on subtlety and start to think that the actions of a deranged fictional character are actions that are much more common in the real world. People will use the bad faith actions of a fictional character to justify hatred towards groups who are genuinely just trying to live their happiest life. So as a result, Futurama ends up taking a blasé approach to a sensitive topic that has since caused the episode to age poorly due to saying nothing and saying it bad. Obsoletely Fabulous Mom unveils her newest robot model, Robot 1X, which she shows off as completely outclassing her earlier models. Farnsworth gets a 1X, which starts showing up Bender in various ways to the point that he starts to feel obsolete. 
So he goes into the shop to get a compatibility upgrade, but upon seeing the effect it has on other robots, runs away by sailing aimlessly into the ocean. There, he meets a group of obsolete robots who teach him the wonders of outdated technology, or even rejecting tech outright. This lesson gets internalized too far as Binder decides to downgrade himself to a wooden model and then to wreak havoc on the tech-dependent world back in New New York. But when he starts attacking the Planet Express crew to get his vengeance on Robot 1X, the Planet Express ship collapses on them and catches fire. Binder tries to come to the rescue, but his fragile wooden body can't handle the flames. So he asks 1X to save his friends, teaching Bender that perhaps the new robot isn't so bad after all. In the end, it's revealed that the last two acts were all in Bender's head, and that the lesson he learned was merely part of the upgrade. The stories we see in various forms of media have a profound effect on the way we interpret the real world, what ideas become normalized, and which things become familiar. In this episode, Bender is told a made-up story in his head to get him to learn a lesson. And despite the story being fake, the moral he takes away from it is still very much real. Much in the same way that, despite knowing that TV isn't real, people still watch it and internalize lessons from the small screen. Seeing an idea get repeatedly mentioned will eventually have an effect on the way that idea is reflected in your head, from preparing you to see the unfamiliar in the real world to judging it for being outside of your comfort zone. Bender fears losing his purpose in life, but eventually learns to embrace the change, with a bit of irony in the fact that he was even worried in the first place due to the fact that Bender has never been especially concerned with whether or not he actually had one. It's not so much that Bender wants to be useful, but that he wants to feel useful. That he could be a model employee if he felt like it, the potential mattering more to him than the actual act of helping out. The Farnsworth Parabox The professor creates a dangerous experiment, culminating in a mystery box that he urges his crew not to look inside of at any cost while they wait to have it thrown into the sun. Leela is set to guard it, but after several hours her curiosity gets the better of her, and she flips a coin to determine whether or not to look. It comes up as heads, and she peeks inside only to fall in. It turns out the box contains a parallel universe, which they call Universe 1, with Leela being from Universe A, and that the difference between the two is the outcome of coin flips. The Planet Express crew of Universe A is forced into Universe 1, as both professors believe that any parallel universe must be the evil one. The crew spends the day with their alternate selves, with the reveal that Fry and Leela are married in Universe 1, Leela dating Fry with something she decided on a coin flip. Ultimately, it's determined that neither group is the evil universe, so they're free to go back home. But the Zoidbergs conspire to steal the box containing Universe A, so Farnsworth creates many more in the hopes of recreating the original universe box. There's a mad scramble to find the original universes before Hermes A throws the box into the sun, which ultimately barely makes it. In the end, the universe parabox is resolved, and both crews end up with a box containing their own universes. Futurama is at its best when it uses a sci-fi concept to explore its characters. In this episode, it takes a parallel universe to show slight differences in its characters' lives. Fry and Leela aren't dating, but the will-they-won't-they -they dynamic of their relationship treads just enough water that it would take very little to get them to do so. Despite so many other characters having distinct physical characteristics, none of their personalities are very different, something we've seen before in other mirror image characters such as Flexo. Leela ultimately decides to take a chance on Fry, seeing how taking that same chance in the parallel universe worked out well for her, and this is something that is ultimately shown to be a positive change. And far from it being anything out of character to do, as Leela 1 was effectively an exact copy of Leela A. In fact, the real development comes not from the chance that she took, but that she didn't leave it up to chance. She flips a coin at the end, but then chooses to ignore the outcome, showing how whether or not dating Fry is something she does on a whim, it's still valuable to take the chance so as not to regret non-action. Three Hundred Big Boys after a military victory over spider people, President Nixon gives everybody in the country $300 as a tax rebate. The episode then splits into various stories about how each Planet Express member spends their money. Hermes buys a pair of bamboo boots for his son, Dwight, but when Dwight refuses to use them, he puts them on and the two lose their balance around the city. Fry decides to buy 100 cups of coffee, slowly drinking them throughout the episode as he becomes more and more hyperactive. 
Leela buys a ticket to swim with an orca, which coincides with Kif's present for Amy, which gets eaten by that same orca, the three conspiring to induce vomiting in the sea mammal to retrieve the watch. Farnsworth buys some stem cells to temporarily reduce his physical age, and he meets and falls in love with a younger woman, who it turns out used her rebate to temporarily reduce her weight. They all meet at a gala to show off the spoils of war against the spider people, hosted by Zap Brannigan, where Zoidberg struggles to find some fancy way to spend his cash, where Bender conspires to blow the smoke of a $10,000 cigar into the face of rich socialites. He spent his $300 on a burglar's kit. But when Hermes' stilts break into the hall and knock Vendor's cigar into the silk tapestries, the whole place begins to burn down. Just then, Fry has his 100th cup of coffee, which speeds his heart up so much that time slows down and he uses the ensuing super speed to rescue everyone, placing them into the alleyway where Zoidberg has finally decided to use his money to buy everyone a feast. This episode has very little in terms of character building and growth, largely existing as a conduit to tell a series of short stories that all tie into one another throughout various parts of the episode. This is even something acknowledged by the narrative itself, which is also very self-aware in terms of how it structures it. From Bender acknowledging that he nearly got away without learning a lesson, to Leela stating the episode's conceit out loud during the ending. There are a few lessons learned throughout the plot, such as Farnsworth acknowledging the moral of honesty, or Hermes coming around to appreciate his son's point of view by the end. And yet, these come about so formulaically that it's almost trite, and it would be were it not for the fact that Futurama has always been very self-aware as a show. So it's likely something intentionally done by the writers to have each story be so simple in order to better support the episode's structure. And it works. This is one of the more memorable episodes purely because of the tight pacing, involvement of the ensemble cast, and all-around good humor. Spanish Fry While searching for Bigfoot at a wildlife preserve, Fry gets abducted by flying saucer aliens. When he stumbles back to camp the next morning, his nose is gone. He mourns its loss for a while before learning that human noses are poached as human horn, considered to be an aphrodisiac among certain alien species. Fry, Bender, and Leela track down Fry's nose to a shady bazaar where they learn that it was sold to Lur of Omicron Persei 8. They then head there, demanding it back, only to see that Lur and Undnd are constantly bickering as they had hoped to use the horn to revitalize their romantic life. But when Binder tells them that human horn is actually a bit lower, Lur changes his mind and attempts to take Fry's once again. But Leela steps in, declaring that they have marital troubles much deeper than an aphrodisiac can fix. So Planet Express sets up a romantic dinner date beneath the skies of the preserve, though it doesn't go well and they try to castrate Fry anyway. That is, until Bigfoot enters the opening and Lur is enthralled by the creature, enough to stop a park ranger from tranquilizing and de-footing the beast. He then realizes that his attempted mutilation of Fry is no different than what the park ranger was trying to do, and starts to regret his actions. The revelation being enough for Ndunun to rejoice that he's back to the sensitive guy he was when they got married. Lur and Ndunun attempt to fix their romantic relationship through enhancing it physically, to no avail as their initial feelings have long since gone away and their marriage is now built on nothing. Like human relationships, we put a lot of stock in physical attraction, despite that being the first thing to go out the window in a long-term relationship. Even Fry's attachment to his lower horn, despite being totally justified, plays into this mentality of sex obsession. The alien poaching humans do so under the impression that they may get some sort of spark out of the horn, despite having not done enough research to even get the right part of anatomy. Much in the same way that The Problem with Poplars handles a physical obsession, this episode 2 has a group ignore logic in favor of a cheap, temporary thrill. But it's not as though the episode takes itself that seriously, at least not enough that any message they wanted to send would be blatant. This plot is almost completely meant to be a vessel for dick jokes, ironically said by Bender of all characters, who has repeatedly in the past failed to understand anything related to human reproduction, as if to add another layer to the absurdity of what's going on. The Devil's Hands Are Idle Playthings Fry is learning the holophoner in order to impress Leela, the way that he was able to impress her back in Season 3's Parasites Lost. But he's talentless, blaming his mistakes on his hands. So Bender encourages him to make a deal with the robot devil, to swap his talentless hands with a random robot's, and the wheel he spins lands on the robot devil himself. 
Now armed, pun intended, with the robot devil's hands, Fry is able to perform beautifully, not only capturing the heart of Leela, but the rest of the world too. He becomes a sensation and is commissioned by Hedonism Bot to make an opera, with Fry choosing to tell Leela's life story. But the robot devil is unhappy with Fry's hands and constantly tries to trick others into swapping, which they refuse. So he makes an elaborate plan to give Bender an air horn, which he immediately blows in Leela's ear, deafening her. Leela, hoping to hear the opera Fry wrote for her, agrees to obtain a new pair of ears in exchange for her hand. The concert is then crashed by the robot devil, who announces that he's given Leela mechanical ears in exchange for her hand in marriage. He demands that Fry trade the hands back or else he'll go through with the marriage, and Fry is forced to choose between the hands that wooed Leela or Leela herself. In the end, he decides to give up his new hands and immediately loses the fame as the audience walks out on the talentless man. Everyone except for Leela, who stays behind to hear how it ends. Much of Fry and Leela's dynamic has been defined by Fry attempting to woo Leela and his attempts falling short. Despite the affection he has deep down, his struggles have always come from being unable to express himself. It's not until trading hands with the robot devil that he finally has the means to do so, and despite this change being temporary, it was still enough. Not only because Fry was able to get his true feelings out there, but due to the follow-up of his selfless surrender of the appendages upon achieving fame. It wasn't just the fame and talent that he gave up, but the admiration of the audiences he had attracted. Grand spectacles are only great for proving a romantic attraction that was already there. They can't be the sole deciding factor, and in this episode, they're not. Futurama previously used orchestrated pieces for its score, but following this season would shift to synthesized tracks, and while this better fits the futuristic themes of the show, it was still a compromise born from necessity. So being the last episode to keep the orchestral compositions, the showrunners chose to go out with a bang, creating an episode that culminates in a musical that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. It does give a sense of grandeur to what they had only recently learned would be the final episode to be produced until some other channel picks them up. And then, just like that, Futurama was cancelled. It didn't get a big announcement, nor was there any grand drum roll that indicated the show was on its way out. While the fourth season had wrapped up development, the showrunners simply never received a call from Fox telling them that they had been renewed, and that they should start production on a fifth. And so the first run of Futurama was effectively over. Its viewership numbers were declining slightly over time, despite Futurama being Fox's most viewed pilot debut in history. The show was moved around from slot to slot, often being pushed back in favor of sporting events that ran long or breaking news reports. And so despite declining yet strong viewership, there's an assumption that the show was not renewed due to a combination of increasing production costs while not growing its audience the same way that an icon like The Simpsons had. There is a bit of irony in the fact that Futurama was a show that spent its infancy and final years in the shadow of its predecessor. The new universe that only received a chance due to the goodwill of the talent behind it, now dropped because that talent wasn't willing to compromise vision for popularity, and ultimately got consumed by the media giant it was trying so hard to run away from. But not all hope is lost. For as much as Futurama's cancellation, well, non-renewal, came as a disappointment to fans everywhere, the show was picked up for syndication by Adult Swim, where its strong performances among the demographic there led to a gradual increase in viewership, while its strong writing ensured that it never waned in popularity. Futurama was proving to be a timeless show, and soon there was enough clamoring to talk of a renewal. But that won't happen in our timeline for another several years, and therefore isn't going to be brought up again in a part 2 to this video. Yep, this video is going to be part one to what will eventually be at least a three-part video. I plan to cover the second run of the show in the future, including the confusingly labeled Season 6A, 6B, 7A, 7B, as well as the specials. So, for movies. This difference between production and broadcast led to a few headaches while planning this video, so I mostly try to avoid broaching the subject for clarity's sake. You've got the timestamps below for individual episodes, and I try to be as comprehensive as possible otherwise. I didn't cover the comics or games or any sort of spin-off, and I likely won't, as I try to focus on shows themselves, and it's not as though this is a universe that assumes its general audience will be familiar with side projects and the like. So hopefully, that's not a devastating loss. Maybe if I want to make a video far into the future, after Futurama has inevitably been cancelled and brought back again, I might include some of that as padding, or maybe it'll just be a side video. But for now, the true reason I haven't covered the comics is really because I don't know how to edit a video around that medium. Oh well, 
The next Futurama video is going to be whenever I feel like it, or maybe when the next season, either 8 or 11, whatever, finishes, and then they start the one after that. I timed this video in such a way that it would come out right before the Revival series start to air, not something I normally consider when scheduling, since I just cover whatever people in the comments section shout out that makes me go, oh yeah, that sounds good. Speaking of, I read every comment that I get, even if I don't reply to all of them. That's the advantage of a channel of this size. So if you have suggestions or comments or any random thoughts that popped into your head while watching, don't feel hesitant to shout into the void of a YouTube comment section, assuming that you won't get any attention. You will at least have one other pair of eyes on it. I suppose that since this section will inevitably be cut out of the full-length future video, it doesn't really matter how I end it. Which is fitting because now I get to make a wrap-up, truly fitting of the first run, cutting off inexplicably part ways through a thought.